Bart, why don't you tell the people who you are, what you do? IFBB Pro, baby. You're a peasant. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> What's the most fancy, flashy thing you've ever spent your money on? Imagine you have your dream girlfriend uh -huh. and her boobs got bigger. Damn. How much more money is that? A million dollars. Jeez. How has your life been since becoming a dad? Like, it's like getting kicked in the nuts. What? Holy fuck, this guy shit everywhere on my most yeah. favorite carpet. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? Shrimp Daddy? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Don't Be Sour. I'm your host, Max Tuning. This is episode 27 with Mr. Bart Kwan, iconic bodybuilder, power lifter, <laughs> entertainer. IFBB Pro, baby. What's up, dude? What's up, man? Welcome to the show. I'm number 27. I know, 27 weeks of this stuff. I feel like you've been doing like 200 of them for some reason. I know. Well, we do once a week, and it's it's actually wild. You know, I, my my last episode that I filmed, it would be like three previous to this one, I had my girlfriend back on. Yeah. And I was worried that people would give me this comment. They had the comment of, this guy's already run out of guests. Cause I had like my first returning guest. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Been doing it for five months, have like one person back. <laughs> they're, they're like, God, this guy's run out of guests. Yeah, like, cause I think you had so much momentum going forward. It just felt like you've been doing it for such a long time. I'm like, dude, this guy's been doing I'm like a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a class act at this, man. Yeah. Welcome to the show, dude. I'm very, very happy. Thank you for having me here. Where, uh, why are you here again in <laughs> Houston? I can't be in Houston. He came all the way down just for the podcast. That's, that's, that's not allowed. I can't just come here just for a podcast. Yeah, I found out like a couple of days. Well, I guess we know we planned this a while ago. Yeah. That's exciting stuff. So, but you're here for. So uh, Russ had a pretty big powerlifting event. And it's like, uh, in, from what I understand, it's probably one of the first of its kind. I think usually gym meets are held at the gym. But I think he wanted to do something different. So the Corrupted Classic was at a venue. So it was like you get all these like top level guys coming together with zero things at stake. So it just became really, really fun because usually if you want to see a top level guy, they're fighting for like a national place, a place in the world or some big like payout. Yeah. And so there's a lot of stress. You know, you don't really get to see the top level guys just have fun. I think that's why people like the all star NBA basketball game because you see top level guys have fun. So it felt like that. You see like a lot of dudes pulling seven, eight hundred. And they're just doing it for shits and giggles pretty much because it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, you know? Were you saying that the powerlifting meets are normally not held at like venues? Like the gym ones, like Barbell Brigade is held at uh, Barbell Brigade, you know? That's because you own the gym. So it's easier, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's cool to see people go like, let's do something different and have it somewhere else, you know? You know what I think low key, the, I, I think that's the like, what the public sees, I think in reality, the reason they're like, instead of having it at the gym, let's have it somewhere else because they realize, we don't have enough fucking space. That's true. <laughs> and it gets fucked. Yeah. The, you know, the old powerlifting like meets, you would go after the meet was over. And I'm talking about like 2012, 2013. And you'll find like piles of syringes and shit. What? Yeah. Like crazy. Like, I don't know if you're part of powerlifting at the time where like people were trying to cut weight so hard for a meet that literally doesn't even matter. Just but it's water cutter. But something. it's their own ego that after they cut weight, they rush back to their hotel room and they're getting like IVs in their uh, like their veins and shit. Do you remember that? Yeah, period? well, it's, yeah, because people. Tr I, I, I mean, I, and people are doing that to like deadlift like four fifty. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like a crazy. Hey, four fifty is you know a lot of weight in, in respective to, to where you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But at that time, like people were trying to squeeze out every single thing, you know, and it was just nuts. So like, I can totally see where people go. I don't want people. Passing out syringes, IVs at my gym. Let's put it somewhere else. I'm pretty sure powerlifting is probably, I mean, I don't, I don't really know this, but I would say that powerlifting in terms of the sports, probably like people are making the least amount of money compared to like most other sports. So it's like, is it that serious to be like killing in, yourself? To, in the fitness game is probably like all the way down here. Yeah. In terms for, of money making. For sure. Even though you think, I like think of powerlifting as like the, the man, like the best of the best, the strongest man, but really yeah. it's. The guys with the prettier muscles, they're making the real money. Way more, dude. Who cares what, how much you can lift? Even if you get a power lifter, like let's say Russ, right? And he pulls 700 or 750 or whatever. And I'm sure the amount of likes is like, let's say this. If he just did one, he just flexed. Mm -hmm. It'd probably be double the amount of likes, you know? Yeah. And that's like not even his sport, but people just want to see sexy things. Russ is a sexy He's guy. He's a very sexy guy. But speaking of sexy guys, let's talk about you, okay. dude. Bart. You know, normally we start this podcast out with like shots and whatnot. It's for like, real. Yeah, it's like eight forty in the morning. Wow, so. you guys are crazy. You know, it's not because I'm a raging alcoholic. It's because I feel like it lo loosens it lo loosens people up, lubes I'll them drink, up. I'll drink your ghost then. That's not. That's very good stuff. Have you had that one? 
It's fine. I, I, I tested positive for COVID yesterday, but it's good. I honestly want all the COVID. I want to collect them all. I'm going to put that in the clip, dude. <laughs> Bart, why don't you tell the people who you are, what you do? I always like to, to say if, you, if you're in the, like, not necessarily like as your pitch, but like you're to, to me who kind of knows you, but to like, if you're in, if you're in the Uber on the Uber here and someone's just like, like, what do you do in life? Like, what is, what is your go-to? That's a really good question. So, uh, I'm full of fucking good questions. You, I know you are. So when I'm on the plane, cause I fucking hate people. I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> when people go like, Hey, what do you do, man? Like I can tell this guy's trying to have a conversation cause we're flying to Australia or whatever. You're like, here we go. I'm like, well, I'm a writer. And I realized when I tell people I'm a writer, do you lie? Uh, kind of. So <laughs> it's enough where people, they hear it and they go, I think I know what that is. And they go, okay, I'm gonna go to sleep. You know? And I'm like, yes. So like, gotta, that's boring. I don't want to talk to anybody, but it's also honest enough where if they ask follow up questions, then I can get to the truth. So I am technically a writer because my start on YouTube with, was with JK Films where we wrote skits. Yeah. So I've written like over probably 600 like scripts in my whole life. So he'll be, oh, what do you write? Well, I'll go back in like 2008. I used to write sketches and stuff on YouTube. And then he goes, oh, what is that? I'm like, oh, it's like a comedy channel, kind of like Key and Peele, The Chappelle Show, that kind of stuff. And then we end up doing, you know, Just Kidding News, which is like a roundtable comedy channel. And then people are like, oh, you look like you lift. Like, give me some fitness advice. <laughs> you look like you lift. You're like, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it goes like slowly down the rabbit hole. Uh -huh. um, but most of the time, I don't like to talk to anyone. I just want to like be to myself. So the writer is... It's a good enough to go like, here, take this and then go away. Or if we actually dive into conversation, I don't have to backtrack and go, you know what? I actually hate people. So I, I was hoping it would go away, but it, it actually goes into like an honest response. You're like, I'm a public figure and I have to, you know, interact with people on a daily basis, but I hate, I hate interacting with other humans. Because all my energy is already saved for that, you know? Yeah. You're, you're like, what if I tell you a really funny joke and then now I, I can't repeat it later? Like it's, <laughs> no, I'm going to forget it. No, I don't care about so, that. So you, you don't dive into like... You, I noticed nothing you said was like, I'm a business owner or like I'm an entrepreneur. You just kind of go with the entertainment side of things. Yeah. I mean, I wish I was. So like, I think, <laughs> I think every YouTube or I think anyone that got onto YouTube in the beginning, um, it's such a, so YouTube itself to make it work. It's such a cool blend of like creatives and business. Yeah. And I think every person that got on, like, especially early on, you don't know which one you are. So you kind of like just double down on both. Like, am I more into like the editing and the cameras and stuff? Or am I into like really like scaling? And then like throughout the years, I realized I actually don't really like business that much. And I think it's not very fun. Yeah, I think I'm much more of a creative person. And so um, that's why like I don't really lead with that. Because then if I run into some random Alex Hermosi or something, he's going to ask me all these questions and make me like feel like shit, you know? Like, oh, What's your so, EBITDA, dude? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> ask me these questions. I don't fucking know. Like, what are KPIs? Like, what, like, what are some fucking metrics that you think your business is doing good or whatever? Like, how are you going to beat next, like last year? I'm like, bro, I don't fucking know these things, dude. I think with YouTube, it, it's more <laughs> like you either become the pinnacle of this top level of notoriety and entertainment, and then no one like kind of like expects you to, like no one cares you to start a business. But if you're not like that top 1% of, you know, let's call it, we'll call it the Casey Neistat, the yeah. Emma Chamberlain, the people just really pop off, even though I think we're pretty cool and we should. I think um, we're pretty cool. But like everyone else is like, they're like, I got to start a business or else like I, I worry about the future of everything that I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, your YouTube itself is kind of a business. You got views, you have ads coming in. You yeah. got to like try to game like, oh, do these titles make more money or does this content do people like should this Should I eat more? Um, like at McDonald's for this video or should <laughs> I make a sandwich in my house? You know, that's stressful stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so you when you lean into like your entertainment past, like I only know Bart Kwan from Barbell Brigade, Bart Kwan. Mm. I kind of, even back then, I I had heard of you on the JK News and like this other realm of YouTube, like the comedy side, but I don't really know much about that. But so do you lean, do you still your, like that's your, your roots or is Barbell Brigade Fitness Bart? It's really split down the middle, which is pretty crazy. Like I remember uh, going to the first Fit Expos and we're trying to like blow up Barbell Brigade and this is probably like 2013, 2014. Like I would be there and then people would be like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? Like I like to lift too, you know? And then we're trying to build this brand. They're like, oh shit, you like to lift and all that stuff? I'm like, God damn it. So like there's that whole side and then there's the other side of like when I'm with my like fitness friends and then like they see like a whole swarm of people that want to take pictures or meet me and then they go, dude, none of those guys look like they like fitness at all. I'm yeah. like, yeah, there's like this whole other comedy side of things. 
So it's like really split down the middle. I would say probably within the last three to five years when you start seeing it come together, like the world's kind of colliding, which is pretty cool. Do you like making, fi- do you like fitness content Bart better or comedy Bart? You know what I realized? I think I just like having a fun, good time. So I think even with- Which the one's fi- more fun? Oh, I mean like, so even with fitness stuff, I think I like doing more like, like the funny stuff. Mm-hmm. Versus like the real serious, like get after motivational. It yeah, 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 yeah. So I think I just like that. So even if I were to start doing, I don't know, like NASCAR content or something, it would be like, how can I make it funny? You know, that's what that's what you, what you went to. It's NASCAR or just whatever <laughs> other <laughs> random. If I started like a cooking show, you know, it'd be like, what would be like the funnier version of that? or just fun time? for You me. are. I, I, I mean, I even see into your fitness content like, you know, I don't want to I don't want to say throughout my, my, my life knowing you, you've, you know, fluctuated in your weight a lot, <laughs> yeah. but you really lean into like, when it's not like, Hey guys, I put on some weight. You're like holding your, your gut and <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. I'm fat. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 You're like fat Bart is here. Yeah. And so, uh, like with JK news, you started that back in like the stone age, right? That's like early, early. So JK films was 2007. JK news was probably 2007. That, I and mean, that's like, OG YouTube. I called myself like probably like 1.5 generation. Cause I think the first first is like the Kev Jumbas. I watched all these people. I've been watching like Kev Jumba or I mean him, like Philip DeFranco. Yeah. Like, from like day one. Yeah, yeah. Like those guys I think are like 2005 gen one. Mm-hmm. And then I would say like, I'm not quite the second generation, but like right in the middle of there. And, and so why did you start leaning into like fitness? It, it's whenever I see like YouTubers, like they're like, we're in the fitness genre, right? Yeah. But I'm like, so does that mean a, a YouTube, all other YouTubers don't work out? Or like, w- wouldn't everyone who works out and make YouTube videos be like a fitness influencer? It's a huge blend now, right? Like yeah. you see gamers that are fucking jacked out of their like mind. Like Mercs or- yeah. yeah, and you're like, what the fuck is this? Are you a fitness YouTuber? Yeah. Are you a fitness Twitcher, <laughs> Switch streamer? Yeah, so I think in the beginning for us, we were just doing like funny stuff. And I think like a lot of uh, YouTube channels back in the day, things were just organic. You know, like yeah. these days people, they, they come up with like, a, a brand name, a logo, a look of everything like day one. There's like really polished YouTube channels from video one and it looks insane. For me, it was just, we were just doing regular funny type stuff. And then all the, com- there would always be at least one comment that's like, hey, you look like you live, like tell me your program. And I'm like, bro, I'm not a personal trainer. And then it would just go on for years. And then finally I was like, well, you know what? I actually do train like quite a bit. So maybe I'll just document my journey. So I would just record like the stuff that I was like doing. Oh, this is what I like to do. You know, and then from there, I think um, I was like, you know what, this kind of be like a brand. Because at that time, like it was like, from what I understood, it was almost like pre Gymshark, pre all the stuff that we see now. So yeah. there wasn't really like a fitness brand. The 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 only other thing to compare it to was, you remember like those House of Pain, <laughs> like yeah. stringers? Yeah. It's either like a t-shirt with crazy tribal on it or stringers. Like it was like this huge gap. And I'm like, there's no like just regular clothes for regular people in fitness. So that's like kind of how Barber Brigade was born. Did all of your JK news buddies, I know there's like a lot of people in that yeah. like JK world. Mm-hmm. They didn't gravitate to the fitness stuff with you? Um, all of them have had their face. So all of them had had their phase of where they either like, uh, like I got one of my friends. She's like only like maybe a buck, like uh, 102, 103. Small. Small chick, never lifted in her life. And then through like three to four months, I got her to squat 135 and her brain exploded because like she was like, I never thought I was able to do that. I can squat way more than 135. That's oh, not yeah. very impressive. Yeah, it's not impressive at all. So <laughs> right after I just took the once, just slammed <laughs> it on the ground. Like, get out and of I my overhead gym. pressed it. Yeah. And then I've had friends that like lost 30 pounds with me and stuff like yeah. that. So I think everyone has had their phase. But, you know, like I think fitness, if you're like one of those guys that just like to train, it those guys will stay around. And I think for other people, they're just dabbling in things, you know? Yeah. Okay. Cause like for me, it's like whether I have a goal or not, I just enjoy training. That's like my skateboarding, you know? Do you skateboard? Not really. Can you do a kickflip? I could barely ollie, but I can't. I have to stand still. I can't like go straight in the <laughs> I got to be standing still on grass. Uh, <laughs> or carpet. <laughs> and I would, can do like a two-inch ollie. F- yeah, you got to film it in slow motion so you can see that the back wheels actually incre- or got off the ground. Yeah, I can snowboard way better than I can skateboard. Do you skateboard? I do all I do all the board board stuff. Really, like wakeboard, surfboard, all that. I can do all of that. Damn. I'm extremely no, surfing. I did one time in Australia. Hated it. I'm like a big board guy, so I love snowboarding, love skateboarding. But you don't like the swimming part, huh? Well, no, it's hard, man. Have yeah. you gone suit for surfing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just the process of getting out to. I did it in That's the, the swimming part. I did it in the Gold Coast of Australia with like 
not like baby waves. I mean, I wasn't yeah, you know, oh, I hitting see. 10 foot waves, but like, I mean, just the, the paddling to get out there is tough. They didn't take you to like a beginner no. section? Because I learned in Hawaii and it was awesome. It was like every wave was like a 30 second oh, no. slow thing. I'm getting wrecked. So yeah, it's- My it nipples was, are like rubbing against the board <laughs> and stuff. And, and you're like, you have to like arch your head up like yeah, to yeah, like yeah. look up and it's, and then, you know, you have those experiences like I have, I have those flashes of like when you're in a movie, like when you crash yeah. and you're, and you, you, you think of those movies where they're underwater, like tossing and turning and you're going to hit a reef. Oh, you don't like, like that? Th that happened. <laughs> when, when you go underwater, like it's, it's exactly like in the movies. Yeah. You're like, I have no idea where I am. I, I don't know where the top of the water is. Yeah. You're like, I'm, I might die. Under you don't here. know where up from down is. And then you can crack your head on a skull. So if you ever like wipe out. So um, in junior high, I was in the swim team. And you uh, look like a swimmer. That's a swimmer's body. Really? Yeah. I'm not like 6'3". I'm actually really short for a swimmer, actually. Yeah. So I was on the swim team, and during the summer practices, we would like go to the beach, and we had like a, a bodyboard team, and people would body surf and stuff. So I'm like very, very comfortable at the beach. And early on, you just learn that as soon as you wipe out in any way, you have to like cover your head because your head, because you, you don't know up from down or whatever. You can slam your head on the ground, on rock, coral, whatever. But then I started to like really enjoy that because it's like almost like, where else are you going to get this controlled like space shuttle crash? You know, no, I don't. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> the funniest part about surfing it is like, do you enjoy skateboarding, but with like really pumped triceps because you're fucking paddling <laughs> yeah, the whole time, yeah. and then now you're like this, and you're like, fuck, my fucking tries are pumped. Yeah, I, I think I like to try everything, but I tried surfing one time, and I think I can shelf it. I think I can be like, I tried it, Done. not for me, not for me. Wakeboarding's cool. Wakeboarding's cool. I, snowboarding is what I, I think my favorite now skateboarding yeah. was when I was a kid, yeah. but now like I'm, I, I'm still just as good at snowboarding now as I ever was. So like, oh, and I can go three years without what it. What can you do? You could do fucking pop shove it's and all that crazy shit on a skateboard. Kick flips. Yeah. 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 Easy. Yeah. I, could, I, I, I'd both. say within the first five tries, like if we stepped out of here with a kick with a board, I could like do a kick flip. Wow. You can go fucking both ways. Like goofy yeah. and uh, well, you can't do it. Switch. It's like, Cause that helps out in snowboarding. A lot. Yeah, doing like the different stances. Yeah, like because if you hit like a jump or whatever, sometimes you don't know how you're going to land. But, was it, but with skateboard, I, we're going on a whole tangent here. With, with skateboarding, it, <laughs> it, it's all about how cool you look. He, who's that guy? Nija Houston? Houston? The guy with all the tattoos? No, he's like sponsored by Monster. He's like, the you know, like Tony Hawk was the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, I wouldn't call him the new Tony the Hawk. The new guy? He's better than Tony Hawk. Like he's just like the top of skateboarding right now. Yeah, but he was like, he's been doing it since like those guys, since mm. the Eric Costins and stuff were around, but he's just stupid, insanely good at it. And it looks so effortless. Yeah. Like he's just doing 360 flips downstairs and you're like, did he even try? He, he's probably like listening to Mozart in his, in his speakers. That's like, like powerlifting right now. That's like when I watch Russ and it, he's just like 800 pounds. And I'm Dude, like, God, there's guys who are like 19 squatting like 700 and shit. I'm like, what the fuck? is going on dude just like in skateboarding like now you have to be so much better because all the the young bloods are like coming up yeah that's how i feel about powerlifting mm -hmm. you know there's a kid i i was once the guy who could deadlift all the weight yeah yeah, yeah. now there's like people that go to my old gym uh district barbell and just, there's a kid who's like 145 pounds i almost feel disrespected that he's doing this in my old gym he's like yeah. 145 pounds hitting like 700 is uh nabil I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's Virginia. He, yeah. 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 I'm like, how dare you do that at, at my job? I, I was supposed to lift all the weight there. I know. I was once that guy too, for like two weeks. And everyone <laughs> just got strong as fuck. <laughs> I remember I was like 165 in like two, 2013. I was like my first meet. I pulled 501. And then for probably like a brief three months, you know, on powerlifting. What was that uh, website? Powerlifting watch or something like that. I don't and know. I was one of the top 50 deadlifters in America at one point. And I think everyone was like, oh, you can do that. And probably it was just like, douche, I got pushed all the way down to like number 300. It, it, it's, it's because at the time there wasn't that many people like on social or like they wanted to be like on YouTube or whatever. And yeah. now it's the commonplace. So now it's just, I, I say freaks in a good way, but now like the, sh the strong freaks are just like coming out of like the caves that are like, I've been here this whole time. Yeah. Like, let me make my Instagram 800 pound deadlift at yeah. 150. And you're like, I hate myself. Yeah, I'm like, I'm. I just keep doing 405. So you keep talking about powerlifting, but uh, you were recently on the Graham Stephan show and he called you a bodybuilder. So he's a genius. Yeah. Because uh, he would call me a bodybuilder and he would call me all these other like names that I'm like, I don't know if I'm really any of those. 
And then after we were shooting, he was like, well, we got to get views. And so, no one's going to care about a power yeah, lifter. Like, no one cares about powerlifting. Like, it's like, we got to go bodybuilding and we got to, I'm like, damn, you're like an SEO master. Yeah. So I was like, okay, you do your thing. Um, just a lot of the people say I'm a bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah, like just the, call the, him the whole show, he's calling you bodybuilder. And I'm just like, I don't think Bart has ever said that he's a bodybuilder, no, ever. I've never stepped on stage. I've never, you know, and I, and I, I picture all these body, like actual bodybuilders watching. I'm like, who the fuck is him? I've never even seen him before. Like he, he just had like Jay Cutler on and you're yeah. like, he should have called him a power lifter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crossfitter, Jay Cutler. Tell me how you did it. So, and, and, you know, doing that podcast, you're li now living out in Vegas. How are you liking that? Because you were in LA. Yeah, yeah. We love Vegas. But is it because the costs or is like, why? Because it's just a desert. So, I, yeah. So I would say... The two main things that make me love Vegas, and this is it's so sad that this is like what my standard is. Coming from LA, my only standard, now that we have a family, is I want a place where people leave me alone. And then- Bart does not like people. <laughs> well, I want people to, to not go like, I need you to be a Republican or I need you to be a Democrat. Oh, I just want people- They to did that in LA? Dude, I, so we lived in a, um, it's not a gated community, but it might as well be because you pay HOA fees and stuff. And we have our own park, right? And that was going to be the place, our forever home. And that's an inside joke for everyone on the channel. I've, I, I was doing some research. I, you keep people, calling everyone forever. Yeah, because everyone's like, okay, this is like forever from 18. It's like when everyone buys their dream car. Until, this is my dream car until <laughs> I buy my next dream car. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was supposed to be our forever home. And we're supposed to stay there for a while. I did all my research. Cool, uh, cool district. Um, very like, you know, like down to earth, family suburb vibes. And um, we had our own park at our own park during the pandemic. I mean, like this is like we pay for this park through the HOA, right? It's my park, my park. <laughs> I go there with my kid. We're playing outdoors in the sun. And then there's this dad. He, he goes like, where's your son's mask? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, this is he's like, he needs to wear a mask at this park. And I'm like, do you even live here? I've never <laughs> seen him before. He goes, no. I'm like, then you need to get out of my park. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? So I just want to be in a place yeah. where like, leave me alone. And uh, so that's standard, like pre work is number one, leave me alone. The other one is, I just don't want to see homeless people on my street. It's, it's like, actually, if people haven't been to LA, like it's, it's crazy. It's man. on another level. Like yeah. you go to any, even downtown Houston, you go to any, like there's, you know, homeless epidemic. That was that the right word? I don't know. It's a homelessness. Problem. It's, it's issue, a problem yeah. everywhere. Yeah. LA is another level. Like yeah. you, you have to, I'm walking on the sidewalk. Oh, I need to walk on the street for the next mile because I can't walk on the sidewalk because there's a hundred tents. And there's human shit on the ground. Yeah. Like it's, literally in front of our house, um, there would be like human feces on the ground. And then I'm like playing catch with my kid. And he's like, what is that? Papa's and he's like, dad had to go to the bathroom. Oh yeah. I'm like, that's not supposed to be there. Yeah. Let's go play over there. And it was just a common occurrence in our house. Um, we ended up having a uh, like 12 Nest camera yeah. set up all over the place because uh, for some reason they really liked going through that neighborhood and they would set fires, just random fires, random like uh, fireworks. Homeless uh, people would set fires? I, I learned that that's a thing. I don't know. I don't know why either to keep warm or just to be a nuisance or something, but there's <laughs> fires going on all the time, like too close, too dangerously close to our house. There's human caca. And then there's a ton of break-ins, like people's Amazon packages being stolen, people's cars like being broken into. Yeah. So we were like, and that, that home was like a million dollar home. We're like, why are we paying this much and paying these HOA fees? And it's like, so we're like, let's get out of there. So that, those were my only two main requirements. And then actually there's a point where I was like texting you and Christian too. And I was like, hey, like, how do you guys like Houston? Cause I was like open anything. I was like, uh, Utah seemed like they had it together. Texas seems like they have it together. Yeah. Um, I was even thinking Idaho at one point. Um, and then Vegas. And then I think just through like, kind of like uh, going like, okay, what if I have a family emergency? How long would it take to get back to family? Um, if I was working remote, there's going to be a time zone difference. And so just through kind of like the rest of the things that I would say probably aren't super big priority, but still make a difference, Vegas ended up being the spot. And then so far, I love it so far. Is, is, that, is all your, your buddies from your work, are they all still in LA? Um, yeah, 90 what, what's the biggest re like everyone that I know moves to LA gets out of LA, but then there's obviously the people, you know, that are, like, are still there. What do you think is the biggest reason why the people who have been in LA for so long and are just like, this is where I'm going to stay. Like, cause so, obviously the, the problems you have are probably the same problems that everyone has, but like, what, what do you think is like keeping people in LA? Cause so it, I, it ain't the cheap cost. Yeah. So I think there's two things. If you're in entertainment, it's still the entertainment capital of the world. So all of my JK side of friends, people that are trying to get into TV shows, movies and stuff, 
like that's still the hot spot, you know, like they might be shooting in Louisiana or in Vancouver or whatever now, but all the big meetings, like the Netflix building, it's in LA. So all the, all that stuff is still going to be in LA. So if you have those dreams, that's still like one of the hot spots. And until uh, Joe Rogan moving to Austin, mm. like even the comedy scene, the biggest one is LA, New York. So there's that. The other one that I think that's sadder is I think people have Stockholm syndrome. You know what that is? I'm, I, I couldn't perfectly describe it. I'm, I'm, I'm someone who would be like, yeah, I know what that is, but I don't actually know what it means. So it's like when like, let's say you, uh, let's say I have a, a girlfriend that beats my ass every day. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so she beats Geo. me up. Yeah, she, she does beat me up. So maybe I have to do that stuff. Talking to so she beats me up. And then like some people, they'll leave, right? Like they, social services come. And uh -huh. like, you know, it's like, oh, this is a domestic violence case or whatever. And they separate them. And then three months later, they're back. And they keep going back. And they keep going back. And it's because even though it's a shitty situation, they got comfortable with it. It hurts so good. It hurts so good. Exactly. So I think some people... They just get comfortable and they're like, I love this traffic. This traffic's amazing. I love this human shit on my foot that I just walked when I was going to Starbucks. Yeah, and they get used to it. So they're actually comfortable in that. And then I think uh, it's kind of like the dudes that like they leave jail and then it's a whole new world. And they're like, you know yeah, what? I think I'm going to commit a crime and go right back inside. Yeah, I'm yeah. used to this now, you know? So I think there's people that are like, it's the being uncomfortable for a short amount of time is too scary compared to just being like, slightly miserable but manageable they're like yeah I, I mean yeah moving and just having like significantly lower cost of living and less stress and you know cleaner air and less traffic that sounds nice but i think i'm just gonna stay here <laughs> <laughs> exactly dude like I'll, i think i'm the most annoying friend now because like all the people i care about i want them close to me right yeah so i'm probably like las vegas's best real estate agent because i'm pitching to my friends all the time and i show them like air quality like look at la like it goes from like um <sighs> Look at this, guys. <laughs> yeah, like on, on the phone, it literally goes from like green to like red, right? Like green, yellow, red. Red obviously being bad. Yeah. LA is consistently in the purple. Bro, you can see it. I've been on the, yeah, the, the, the highway and you like can see the smog. Like it's yeah. like visible. It like looks can, like brown cotton mm -hmm. candy just floating on the mountains. Yeah. And it's always in the purple. I'm like, you guys see that, right? Like we're all breathing this shit. And uh, Vegas is pretty much green all the time. So there's that. There's, I'm like, you guys like paying taxes? Cause you can say, I hate lot. it. Yeah, exactly. You save so much more. Like, so um, my last house in Vegas, um, we bought it at a really good time and then we ended up uh, selling it for a million over than when I bought it for. Yeah, so, I saw the video. So that's awesome. Right. I made a million a year. That exact home. If I had that in California, I would have paid 130 grand in ta extra taxes than I already had to. So I have to pay federal taxes. You can't get around that, but I would have to pay <clears throat> an additional 130 grand for no reason. Just because I, I crossed like this imaginary barrier yeah. you know I, I feel like la is one of those things that like when you're in it you make every reason of why you're staying there and then mm -hmm. when people leave you're kind of like why did i stay there that long yeah. like it, it's you know it's like when people i was just talking to my brother about this when he you know comes here and he's like oh my god like that house that's like your house max like that would cost three million dollars in la and like oh my god your gas prices are so cheap i'm like you don't have to stay in la like yeah. the, you can have these you can have this yeah. if you move to wherever with yeah. with uh vegas do you are you big Drinker or partier? Partier? No, not really. So I actually... Um, How old are you now? Third, I'll be 38. By the time this comes out, I might be 40. Damn, you're old. <laughs> but I'll be 38 this year, yeah. Huh. yeah. Not a big drinker? No, I... Um, so that's the other part of Vegas. I think people don't know that. It actually has a really strong suburb community, like all around. Like yeah. in Henderson, Summerlin, Southwest, Centennial Hills. So I learned all of these... Um, after I moved there, for me, I'm one of those guys, like I would consider myself like a quick trigger puller. Like if I have like my top three things that I look for, if it's there, I don't really sit on decisions long. I just go, boom, okay, that's cool. So a lot of Vegas, I actually fell in love with after I moved because mm. I didn't see all the other cool like, like benefits. Like for example, um, when I go to the park, I call it the B-roll life. Like we would, there's this park next to our house and I would just see like- Is it your park? Uh, all the parks. And I would All just, the parks are your parks. I mean, the other one you paid for this is my park no no all the parks are have the b-roll like, okay like you just see guys like throwing frisbees and shit with their kids i'm like dude i never see shit like this in la or yeah. you see people like set up like a volleyball thing on the field and they're hitting and then like two like like old couples like holding their arms like side they're by inviting side. they're like hey you guys want to play volleyball with you're like me yeah like me what the hell <laughs> you know versus like in uh because it almost seems like they're about to shoot like a family movie and uh -huh. they go like background extras action you yeah. know i'm like is there a movie? Because it feels like a movie set. But then a lot of America, 
is actually like that. Like the norm of LA is actually not the norm where 5 p.m. everyone scrams because who knows what the fuck's going to happen at the park, you know? Yeah. And yeah. With, with LA uh, being your, your new home, but you're like, a lot of your friends who are in your work and you have Barbell Brigade and everything's still in LA. How is your, how do you manage your time being like, not near all the stuff that that's where like your businesses are. So we got a pretty cool schedule now where, um, so for JK news, I have to shoot twice a month and then we bulk shoot. So we shoot Thursday, Friday, Saturdays for two times a month. So two times a month I leave Vegas and while I'm there, then I pack it with all the barbell brigade stuff. And then the cool part about Vegas too, is it's close enough where if like some three hours, yeah, like a three, four hour drive, and there's times where I have like same day flights. Like if I have a big meeting that I have to be at, then I'll just fly there, which takes like 45 minutes, go to my meeting and I'll fly back home. Yeah. And that's, and it'll be like a hundred bucks, you know, like the flight's only like $89 or something. It's like cheaper than an Uber sometimes. Have you ever thought of t taking like Barbell Brigade, for example, and be like, now you're also a Vegas gym or Vegas That world. would be cool, except um, I just know it takes a lot of work to set up gyms. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know if we're ready for a second gym. Well, you, you've been at that Barbell Brigade location for for as long as I can remember. I mean, I, I do. I remember I remember on YouTube back in the day, y'all's little video series of like you looking for mm -hmm. the space that now is Barbell Brigade. But I mean, that y'all have had that for 10 years now, over 10 years? Um, since 2014. So almost. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Our first spot was small. It's like 1500 square mm -hmm. feet. We were just testing. We don't know what the hell we're doing. And then we outgrew it in like six months or so we better get a new spot. And then we moved there and we love it, you know. How much is rent at Barbell Brigade? Ooh, it's six. So it started off, you know, those three percent annuum or whatever. So yeah. they love, real estate contracts, they love to put like special. It, it, isn't it wild? They're like, hey, here's your rent, but every year it's gonna go up. Yeah. And you're like, why? <laughs> and I'm like, damn. And it's not and and if every year if I bumped up the membership, people mm -hmm. would fucking throw a fit, you know. Yeah. So it's like it's kind of tough. But yeah, so it started off. Relatively affordable is like a dollar fifty a square foot, maybe. What is without just or how much was it a month? So it's probably like six grand a month when it started. When it started, two thousand fourteen. Yeah. Okay. And then now it's like pretty much ten grand because every every year you got to add the three percent. And then when you're looking at the contract, you're like, oh, it's not, it's not that's only three percent because you're only thinking year to year. Yeah. And then it slowly gets to a point where now I look back and I was like, damn, we used to pay six thousand. Fuck, now I'm gonna pay an extra four well, grand. Yeah, you're like, am I am I making up that four thousand somewhere else, or am I just eating four thousand dollars a month now? We're just eating it. Yeah, you just, hey guys, can you buy some more uh, <laughs> uh, waters at the gym? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're just straight eating it, and then uh, we don't. I mean, we want to bump up the membership, but it's also like such a tough time. We just came out of a pandemic, so yeah. You know, sometimes business owners have feelings and shit, so you don't want to like. How much are gym memberships at Barbell right now? So it's been the same for a long time because we want people to just feel like nice and stable and not yeah. feel like it's getting bumped up all the time. It's a hundred bucks a month um, and day passes are 20 bucks. Okay. Try to keep it simple. And when you, when you started Barbell Brigade, like what was your biggest reasoning besides opening a gym? I mean, um, was it like culture? Was it the, you just wanted your own private space and then it turned into a public gym? Or like, what was the concept behind? Because you're one of the few people that has opened a gym. Like every fitness person always wants to wants have their one. gym, but yeah. you started it. It's a viable business and it's, you know, almost 10 years in, which is crazy. Yeah. So in 2013, um, you got to think probably the most famous mom and pop type gyms at that time were either CrossFit boxes or like Metroflex. Right. That was it. And so for me, um, when I did my first powerlifting meet and I was like, okay, I really like this sport. I want to find a powerlifting gym. Couldn't find anything like that. And then it was just most like secret powerlifters, either like uh, hogging up the squat rack out of 24 mm -hmm. or they're training at like some CrossFit gym or something. So I searched all of LA, couldn't really find anything. And I was like, you know what? Like looking at the CrossFit type equipment, I'm like, I feel like we could put like racks together and it would just change the feel of the gym. So I kind of took like a streetwear, almost like boutique gym, like approach to it. Cause I also felt like things were so functional, but not very like branded or creative. So I felt like there could be a different, more creative element injected into the gym. So uh, that's when we were like, you know, we want to, we want to come up with a cool name, a cool logo, and just make it completely different from what we've seen. Cause CrossFit, it's pretty much CrossFit blank. You know, it's like yeah. whatever you want to call it. And then it almost feels like almost every single CrossFit gym feels the same. Then you go to places like Metroflex and it just seems so raw and so old school. None of the equipment matches and everything's rusty and all yeah. that. 
And I'm like, there's got to be something in the middle where it's like kind of cool, kind of it's like has culture, it feels kind of street weary. And then that's where it was born. I, I when you mentioned the the rustic equipment, um, I think I was talking like I had Ronnie Coleman on here, mm-hmm. and I was um, with, with him. It's it's interesting seeing certain gyms of like a lot of people think that like the older and shittier the equipment, the more hardcore it is. Like you go to the I don't think it's like this anymore, but like the Gold's Venice, I would go lift that Gold's that Arnold's lifting at yeah, all the yeah. bodybuilders, and there's like tears and stuff on the the benches and i'm like why don't they fix this and it's like oh no it's like it's hardcore, raw i'm like yeah. that doesn't make it hardcore that you makes a it lap pull down it's not smooth i know it's fucking hardcore <laughs> yeah. i want to i want to everyone has to have an up-to-date tetanus shot when they when yeah. they come in the gym for the the rust that's on there or you grab like the, you know like the rope pull down and it's like this it's like hanging on by a thread it's just all frayed out and stuff <laughs> yeah. it's hardcore so what have you seen um change in the past 10 years with Bravo brigade like from when you started it to where it is now, or you're, I don't want to say disconnected from it, but you're, you've moved on. Like you've, you're moved. You're not like there every day. Like you yeah. were. So it's, it's kind of cool. I think in the beginning, like any business you build, you almost make it, you try to make it feel like your clubhouse, mm-hmm. you know, like this is like my little fraternity, my little clubhouse. Yeah. And over time you realize clubhouse strategies don't pay the bills. Cause they're usually fun strategies, you know, like, Oh dude, we should just have couches everywhere and fucking order pizza every week, you know? And then they're <laughs> like, wait, how do we increase memberships though? Yeah. Or like, there's people that are complaining. We don't have enough equipment. How does like us having matching t-shirts help them get more equipment? Like how do we serve the customers? So eventually you start going, okay, we need to not serve ourselves or our own tastes. We got to serve the customer. Yeah. And it becomes more and more of a business. So now like if you take bottle brigade in the beginning, Everyone knew exactly who I was. They know like which video or which post they saw that made them want to join. And they're like super about the brand. Um, now I would say probably over 50% of the members don't even know I own it. It's good. Yeah. And it's a business on its own. Like they like going to this gym because it's a well-ran gym rather than like a, like a quote unquote hype gym, you know? Mm-hmm. So that part is really cool. Cause in, now we constantly serve them. We do a good job of getting all the equipment that they want and we really listen to what they want. So that's kind of like the night and day difference. And, uh, but now kind of like, I guess the artist creative end, they're like, oh man, so you're joining the gym because it's well ran, not because it has cool designs. You know, it's like, yeah. it's a little bit different, but I think that's kind of just how business is where like you build something creative and you want people to like really um, vibe with the creativity but that doesn't help with the business and hitting all your numbers. It sucks. Cause you kind of have to like have this balance where you're saying like, Oh, I want to be like a fun time with me and my boys. Yeah. But like, and sometimes when you start making changes of like for the longevity of the business, yeah. people are like, Oh, you're like, you lose in touch with why you started it. Or like, it's, it's not as like you're going more corporate. It's like, guys, it's got to make money. Like yeah. it has to make money. Be like you want to pay the bills. Yeah. Like I don't want to pay the bills. Yeah. Or I can't even do the next fun creative thing. Yeah. Cause you ran out, you know, is there like a, uh, a few, like, the fact that you've been able to stay 10 years in that, or I'm, I see, I just, I keep saying 10 years, but like, you know, a long much. time in that building, yeah. what's next for Barbell Brigade is as a gym, is it a new location? Is it an expansion where you turn on a wall and there's a building next to it? I can't remember. Or like, are you going to open a second one? So I think for us, um, the pandemic in LA, like we, in LA, like the pandemic, we took it pretty hard. Oh, I bet. And I mean, they shut down all the, I'll be, you, you, Barbell was an, a, a destination gym for every when there's Olympia, every event, it was like everyone flooded to barbell. And now yeah. those events are cut off. Are gone, yeah. So we got hit really, really hard. Um, our landlord was super cool. And uh, during the times we were shut down, we didn't have to pay. But now we owe all that back. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the best. Yeah, so He's now, so cool. He, did, he, he made us not pay. But, I mean, we had to pay it all back after. <laughs> it, it, it's like when you get a month free on rent. People don't know. Like, yeah, it's yeah, a month yeah, free. Yeah. But instead of your your twelve month lease, it's actually thirteen months, and yeah. that that free month is now the thirteenth month. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, yeah. <laughs> my landlord's sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for us, so our payments are actually like twelve, thirteen grand. It's like whatever it is plus however much we owe, you know, spread over time. That does sound like a cool landlord. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like I mean, a lot of a lot of the landlords during that time they weren't even willing to negotiate. Like during mid pandemic, I got so many DMs from other gym owners asking me to buy their gym. Really? Yeah. They're like, dude, are you down to buy me? Like I'm in Glendale or I'm in whatever, like I'm just down the street because people, they just didn't really have a nice enough landlord and, and you know, the, the laws kind of like shut them down. 
So for us, we're trying to get like our memberships healthy, which is good. And I'm so happy that a lot after the pandemic, um, the membership came right back because a lot of people, they ended up leaving or they bought home gyms or whatever. So it's cool. It came right back. And then now we're having a ton of visitors again, which is really cool. Um, but we're trying to get ourselves to a spot where it feels more stable and we're less in debt before we like think about what the next step is. It's wild to think of like the pandemic and like, I understand the safety precautions of, you know, when it was at its peak, you yeah. know, whether people are, I can argue that when that peak was, but the fact that like businesses that relied on physical people being there, like there wasn't a plan of like, what does, whether it be the government or whatever does implement to like help businesses like you. And I know there's like the PPP loan mm -hmm. and things like that, but not everyone's going to get it. Not everyone's going to get the same amounts. And then there's like landlords that are like, you still got to pay rent. Cause like they still maybe, even if they're, it could be not even there being a dick. Like they're like, I still don't completely own this building. I still have a mortgage on this. Maybe they yeah. bought the building. Like it's just, it's a crazy time. All of that shit was a shit show. So, you know, for us, because we care about branding, all of our LLCs are the same. It's like Barlow Brigade Gym, Barlow Brigade Apparel, Barlow mm -hmm. Brigade Performance. Uh, even our YouTube channel is Barlow Brigade Productions, right? So that's cool because then if we have like a portfolio, it looks nice and neat on our paper. We filed for or uh, we applied for like a PVP loan. And the government, because they're not familiar with the brand, they ended up sending, I think, the gym loan into the apparel account because they're probably just saying, oh, Barbara, that's it. So they yeah. sent the money there. When they sent it there and we told them like, hey, you sent it to the wrong account. They're like, oh, shit, here's an error. Freeze. So now we're not not only are we not allowed to apply for PPP loans for any of the other entities, that money we can't touch, but we need it back. We we're going to need that back from you guys. So yeah. that didn't benefit us at all yeah. because we just got into like this thing where like we, we thought we're like, OK, cool. Here's like some money. Now we can like, you know, plan long term. But since they fucked up, that whole thing just got frozen. How up. long did that take to solve that problem? Well, with government shit, it takes <laughs> fucking forever. So I think it took. They're like, like, this is the problem. We will get on it in three months. <laughs> yeah. It took like probably eight months. Jeez. Before um, yeah, anything happened. And during that time, like in L.A., uh, gyms and parks were shut down. I don't know if it was like that out here, but they were taking hoops off the basketball boards. I yeah, about yeah. Your backboards, mm -hmm. so people don't even play basketball. I know that was a thing around here. It, didn't they, in in um? I guess this is by like the piers and stuff in L.A. They filled the skate park with sand. With sand, yeah. What? That's how hardcore the city was. They filled it with sand. They took swings off. They took the fucking hoops off the backboards. So it was like that. It was like really, really like everyone stayed the fuck inside. It's like there's one kid by himself on the in the skate park with no one in a mile radius. Get him. Like, yeah, get him. Yeah. <laughs> why isn't he wearing a mask? Like, there'd be like one dude surfing and they'll send the helicopter guy. I'm like, how many fucking dollars of gas was burnt just to go get we, out of well, the water? You don't want the fish to get COVID, dude. Yeah, yeah. So during that crazy lockdown time, uh, even the parks were locked down. Finally, the parks were the first to get opened up, right? And then, so now I'm meeting with lawyers. Cause you know, as a business owner, like you're always trying to win this chess game. Yeah. Right. So now I'm like, okay, cool. That's a park. And everything about legal stuff is defining terms. It's loopholes. And yeah. I'm like, how come a restaurant, they can't serve inside, but then outside, if they set up a tent and it looks completely sealed, they can serve in there. And like, well, that's not a permanent structure, you know? So I'm like, so define permanent yeah. structure. I'm like, if you look at Barbell Brigade, we're technically a warehouse with two giant doors that open up. Can we be classified as a tunnel? You know, so like, <laughs> like, like we're always trying to like, how do we get ourselves open legally? Cause I don't want to break any laws, but the laws are all defined by terms. So I'm meeting with like, I don't know how much we racked up in like legal fees, but I'm trying to figure out, is there a way to get us open? Because I think when the lawmakers are thinking gyms, they're thinking like 24 mm -hmm. where it's like, 20,000 square feet with literally one exit and entrance. And then there's only one ventilation system. So if someone does have COVID, it's like hot boxing. Yeah. I'm like, we have two giant doors that are open and we don't have 10,000 members, you know? So I'm like trying to constantly meet with lawyers and I would see something else. I'm like, Hey, that restaurant is doing this. How can we apply ourselves there? Oh, that park is open. Mm -hmm. Can we open up the back? So that was like our first kind of like foot in the door. We set up the back of Barlow Brigade to make it look more like, like, uh, like muscle beach in Venice. And then, so that was cool. And then we would slowly like bring equipment in. I'm like, what about this area and that area? So that was like a, a whole nightmare during that time.
Bart's like, yeah, I also, I also don't want to mention it, but you almost made like a speakeasy. People would come, you, you could come, you could pay an extra 20 bucks. You come after hours, you shut all the doors I would have <laughs> and you loved come in to. and lift and no one knows. I would have, dude, that was like, and I felt bad too. Cause we have like, I really care about the members. So I also want to be the fucking dick. That's like on Instagram. I'm like lifting in the gym all mm-hmm. by myself. And everyone's like, what the fuck, man? So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to train in my own backyard, bought a cheap Amazon rack or whatever. And then eventually I was like, dude, I need more equipment. So um, the city that I lived in, they uh, they had their own jurisdiction. So I would go in the CrossFit gym there and just train. And then the owner was like, wait, don't you own a gym in downtown? I'm like, yeah, it's a thing with LA. You know, things are crazy locked down. He was like, well, you're welcome here. I'm like, thanks. Well, that's cool. Yeah. And, and probably uh, something, I mean, you're fortunate in a, in a fortunate position with your businesses where like all these costs are accruing for your for barbell. But and you're saying all your buddies who own gyms are having to shut it down but you've been fortunate enough over the years to build up other businesses and wealth that maybe you were able to float and not stress as much about because it's not your only business. How do you, how do you make all your money Bart? Like what are your, what are your, what are your money making streams? So that's a cool part where when you're like diversified, you don't stress out because not all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. So now the goal is uh, how do you get it where, they're all doing the same Mm because sometimes one's doing really good. Some's doing, that's how it always is. It's always like that, you know? So I would say all the things that I'm involved in, um, I have the JK side of things, which is uh, mainly YouTube based. We used to do a ton of shows, but um, the pandemic kind of crushed that. And we were like pitching TV shows and movies. Pandemic kind of crushed that too. But that's something I definitely want to get back to. Um, So with Barbell Brigade, we have apparel, we have the gym, we have our supplements. Those are like the three main sources of income. And then I have a couple investments on the side. So we have like a food group that I'm invested into. Food group? Yeah. So we have a... uh, a Hawaiian shrimp concept. Oh yeah. You're always posting about uh, like these restaurants and stuff. Yeah. Like drinks and, and you know, right. and food. So like we had a, a brand called shrimp daddy that was at smorgasbord, which is like the biggest food truck festival in LA. And we were there every single Sunday for like the last, I would say almost five, six years. Mm-hmm. So we're opening our first store in Topanga Canyon. Um, probably when this video comes out, it'll probably be ready. To What's open. it called? Shrimp daddy. Shrimp daddy. Shrimp daddy. Yep. So it's Hawaiian shrimp. And so that one's doing pretty good. And uh, we have our uh, matcha franchise, Jumbi. And we just, oh, so we have one in Princeton. We got one in City of Industry. And then we have one in Westwood, which is like West LA. We just opened one in Hawaii. And what? Yeah. So that one's doing pretty cool. But none of these, like in the investment phases, when people think, oh, dude, you're involved in like five or six drink stores. All that goes right back into yeah. That's like develop. a separate long term. Yeah, type that's of. like you're. That's like money you're not going to see for like five years or mm-hmm. ten years. You know, you're just trying to build this thing. So it's like saying like I have twenty orange trees. You're like, oh, you must have a ton of oranges. Like, no, they're all like seed links. You know, that, that's the analogy you. Could, I don't know. <laughs> you're so wise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all just fucking seeds in the ground. You know, did your like grandfather like <laughs> son? You have an orange tree. Like I've never heard of making an analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So like, yeah, I have a bunch of things I'm into and now I'm trying to get more into like real estate and stuff. Um, so I do have like a lot, a bunch of little things. I would say like the main things that pay me for my lifestyle, it's like 50% the JK stuff and then 50% what I do in borrow over game. If you're ever interested in losing money, you can always invest in the stock market too. Oh yeah. Like right now they're <laughs> down like great or crypto. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Crypto I, got its ass kicked. The it's last so funny. Year. I was one of those people. You're always like, everyone, everyone on Instagram's like, look how much I'm up. Now it's like, no one talks about anything. No one talks about it. Yeah, especially crypto. <laughs> I, I do have stocks. I mean, it's more my retirement account. So, like, the way I like to view my life and how to be secure financially is I could try to look at my life in like little buckets. So, I'm like, okay, what? Orange trees, if you will. Yeah, orange trees. Like, what, what orange tree is going to give me oranges when I'm like 50 and above? What orange trees are going to give me between 40 and 50? Which orange trees are going to be oranges? you know, from like now until 40, which for me, it's very, very soon. Um, and I kind of look at it that way. So I just make sure to like, I plan enough orange trees and or I plant enough orange trees in phases where I feel like I don't have to stress out. You know? I think the older that you get, the more you care about your future orange trees, mm-hmm. because <laughs> there, that, there, there was some video now. I consume, I consume a lot of content on YouTube yeah. I, as, as much as I was watching Kev Jumba and mm-hmm. like Kasim G and yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I still, to this day, I'm consuming YouTube videos like listening to him when I'm driving, when I'm on my lunch, like at night, like I'm, I'm still big on YouTube. Like so from food to finance just ev- ev- to everything, oh, I'm just shit. like refreshing the homepage of even stuff I'm not subscribed to, to see if something perks my interest. And so I'm watching like a lot oh, of like cool. document, 
just different topics, right? Yeah. And one of them, like how you're saying with all these orange trees, is there's a video that says that um, people in like their 20s, it's hard for you to think of yourself in the future. It's really like, hard. Like to think about, you're like, I don't care about 60-year-old Bart. I'm 22. Yeah. But, you know, 35, 36, 37-year-old Bart's like, I'm, I think about the old ones. And I, I think the older you get, then you start realizing how important everyone keeps saying of like, you need to set yourself up for the future, see you know, for the future. Whereas like, I've always been like, I don't, dude, I don't care. I'll, like I'll figure it out like down the road. And you know, even, even now I'm like, Oh, I wish I'd done things earlier on that I'd have more just like uh, orange trees, if you will, planted. Yeah, I think the, the first role model that I had in that is you hear of like, all, you have all those NFL documentaries. <laughs> just losing their ass. Yeah. These guys that get like seven, eight figure contracts. And then like they, Later on in their life, they're like, yeah, I just like work at Petco now or whatever, you know? And you're just like, what the fuck? Like, like where did you spend all that money? Yeah. And it's like, like way more money than the average YouTuber. Yeah. So I know that that's definitely a risk, but until you walk through it, you don't quite embody it, you mm -hmm. know? So like from the beginning, I was like, well, I know that can happen down the line. So like as early as I could, I always- You know you're going to lose everything and work at Petco? Yeah. So I was like, I, I got to put money away into retirement. So I did that as early as I could. And not even like based off principle, I didn't even believe it because you're so young, you know, mm -hmm. but then now looking back and I'm like, since we started making like decent money on YouTube, there's probably been hundreds of thousands of dollars spent so stupidly Yeah, that I'm like, man, had I like bought a house here or bought stocks there or did whatever, like I'd be in a much, much better, like one of the videos that makes me the most sad then I go, I'm fucking retarded. Can I say that? <laughs> yes. I'm fucking retarded. <clears throat> this Graham Stephan has this video. Uh -huh. And he goes, check out my like $13 million portfolio or whatever like that, right? And he goes, so I bought my first property when I was 19. I'm like, damn, you were that fucking smart? He goes, by the time I was 21, I was already a millionaire with passive income. And I'm yeah. like, what the fuck? This guy, dude, so smart. So I'm yeah. just trying to be at 39 I'm going to try to aim to be a 19-year-old Graham Stephan. That's my goal. You're only 20 years off, man. I know. Hindsight's 2020. You know, and if we were all, and I think that the problem is that everyone always thinks you get to like, I don't want to say, I mean, I hope that all of our, our peaks of, is that my phone or your, someone's phone's vibrant? No, mine's never on vibrant. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> This is technology is ruining this podcast. Um, you always think that like this, whether it be insane money is like always going to be rolling in at the same speed, especially when you start popping off. You're like, this yeah. is going to be like this forever. Yeah. And not to say, you know, there's definitely people who like lose the momentum and they kind of fall off. But in a perfect world, if you're smart, you should be able to keep some level of higher income, you know, because you, you have the smarts to, to make X amount of money at one point, you should be able to carry that on to some percentage yeah. in, in the future. Are you uh, someone who's comfortable with, could you, could you give people the insight of like, let's just take last year and or this year of like total like revenue that you, like all of your businesses kind of like accrued together? I don't actually have that math. What's like I, a ballpark you think? Ballpark in total? Like, IRS is like, listening. Like gross? Yeah. 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 Like gross. Yeah. Before expenses, before everything. Like, let's say last year. Like, what did you do last year between everything? Between everything? Maybe. Probably between, like, four or five million or something like that. That's wild, man. Is it? I don't know. But then how much <laughs> I receive is not that, you know? No, I know. <laughs> you know, I like how, I like how you, like, you're like, oh, but the last year, like, probably, like, four or five million dollars. And, like, is that is that good? Because I know you you and your crew, you guys no. are crazy. <laughs> no. You, that, Sean that, Lee, no, Christian, no. you guys are nuts. <laughs> no, no. You're like, dude. <laughs> I'm in Target and Walmart and <laughs> at every single, I'm like, God damn. That, well, the problem nowadays is that if you're not making $10 million a year, you feel like a peasant compared to like, because you see everyone, uh, here's my new Lambo. Only here's this, this new, crew. <laughs> no, this no. This Houston crew. Yeah, I, I would say Sour Strips is crushing it, but I was like, our margin's like, eh, like way down here. But um, no, that, that, that's super impressive. And, and, it's, and it's crazy to see like you diversify into like all these different aspects because, um, you know, not everyone does that. Some people put all their eggs, all their oranges into one tree. Yeah. What, uh, out of all the businesses that you do, Barbell, uh, we'll say you as a personality, whether it be any like social. Oh yeah, so group. I have my, that's something I left out there. I also have my own personal brand. So within the personal brand, uh, me and my wife, Gio, we do a podcast. Yeah. And then we also have our family vlog channel. I left right. that out in the 
and the things I was listing up. How much more money is that? No, no, I, I calculated after I started doing all the math, I was like, oh, yeah, I left out a couple other things that I do personally. Okay. Yeah. Not, you're not doing too shabby, dude. What is, the, what is out of all the businesses, what, what brings in the most revenue? I don't revenue? have a barbell land. <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, I'm not, like, like, Charlie's buying a property. Heidi's buying a property. I'm, the, I'm not buying a property. I saw Charlie's fucking video. He's like, like uh, your, your life could be your dreams. And he just shows like a fucking, like four football fields. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is that, dude? It, before it was, it was, you had to own your own gym or own your own clothing line to be successful. Now, it, now, now the, the standard is you need to own your own 10 acre property. Yeah, you need to own a zip code. If not, you're fucking you're fucking up, dude. <laughs> you're a peasant. Yeah. Out of all the things you, you make money from, what brings in the most amount of revenue? It changes all the time. Um, right now, I would say Bartle Brigade does. Okay. Um, as a as a group, and we we even though they're separate entities like apparel, the gym, and um, supplements, we do see them as like one ecosystem. So I would say that now. I would say in the height and also because like YouTube, YouTube algorithm changes. So that's yeah. another thing where I think people, they, once they start making money, they think it's going to last forever because they think all the things that make this happen is going to stay the same. But like, just like the NFL where like agents change, rules change, you know, sponsorships change, YouTube changes. Yeah. So, um, there was a point in time, probably back in like 2017 on the vlog channel, which we didn't even really care about. It was just something we want to show our life. So we didn't like, bare minimum, minimum editing. It was making like 30 grand a month just by like me recording like uh, random things. Like you didn't have to have a clickbait title or yeah. like very minimal effort, you know? So at that time, um, when YouTube, when the algorithm was way more friendly, like 2015, 2016, 2017, that was like the big uh, money maker. So kind of things go up and down, you know? Well, so I, I don't really consider you a, I mean, you have your extremely nice homes that I see, but I wouldn't really call you a, a flashy person with your material items. I know I've, if I remember correctly, there's certain fancy cars you've had throughout the years and Porsche, right? Had a Porsche, had a right? Porsche yeah. What's, what's the most fancy flashy thing you've ever spent your money on? What's the most expensive thing, not a house, whether it be a car, I want the most expensive car and other item you've bought, whether it be like a, a watch or something. To so I would say the most expensive thing was probably, I had a uh, Audi RS7. Um, so I got rid of the Porsche cause I was going to be a dad. So, it's, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I, need a, cool dad, I need a dad car. <laughs> I need a sedan. RS7. <laughs> yeah, but it has to be crazy. Yeah. So I had the Audi R7 and then I, I spent like 12 G's on wheels, which is fucking crazy. <laughs> Cause you don't even, like, I, yeah, I put 12 G's on I, and I bought like this crazy exhaust system. So it sounds like a fighter jet. Dude, all, not, okay. Not, not that I just want to quick, quickly interject. You see, you say you're not like. You're like, oh, this group buying land and everything, but you you fall in the category of all this group. Everyone here buys cars, these really expensive cars, and then they do these crazy expensive things to the cars. Mm -hmm. Like me, I'm like, dude, the car's great as is. It is. Why does your Porsche GT3 RS need a, a different exhaust? I was like, they, it's a great exhaust. It already has cool wheels. Because imagine you have your dream girlfriend uh -huh. and her boobs got bigger. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or or she has direct like, analogy <laughs> yeah. yeah so like do uh, you like boobs that's why i bought this these wheels <laughs> yeah so the 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 car i think like you know as an entrepreneur like you're always just trying to satisfy that that little inner child mm -hmm. right so like if you're missing a hot wheel as a kid you're like this is my my dream hot wheel and you just want to go crazy on it. you kind of want to push the limits because i think that's also like a character trait of entrepreneurs, like what makes you want to push and beat last year. It's that same thing that makes you tick, you know, like how can I make this car crazier or how can I get that next PR? Like it's a, it's in your DNA. So yeah, I got a crazy exhaust. I got it chipped. Uh, it's already low and I got it uh, lowered. So low. Yeah. And it's a, it's expensive to lower a car that has like digital airbags. So you can't just buy cheaper springs it's like this module that you have to, so you have to take this whole thing into the store and they reprogram the height of the car. It's all this crazy shit. Every speed bump, you just scrape the bottom of your car. I, with the roads in LA, I pop my tire twice. And when you pop your tires and you have $12,000 rims, like it cracks it and you're like, oh, it, like it's like getting kicked in the nuts. Yeah. And so uh, when that happening, happening is I had that car and I had a truck and I ended up driving, it's just a silver rod, like a regular truck. I ended up driving that so much that my car was just sitting in the driveway. And so I think there's a point where like, you wanna buy everything that you never had and all the stuff that you wish you had as a kid. Mm -hmm. 
And then you realize like the like law of diminishing returns where every extra dollar spent doesn't create more happiness. And then so you start coming down the other way. So I ended up having my my like car, it's pretty much like a supercar sedan. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm not even driving it. So I sold it. And I just want to see how that would feel. Just lost my ass on that sale. <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, yeah, because I had all this other extra yeah. shit I put into it. And I'm, I'm going like, to give you this. But, like, but, but the wheels, like, I don't give a fuck about the wheels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I got like a uh, fucking the decals, like uh, painted to match the mm, calipers. Like love that. all these stupid things that matter to me. But yeah. in terms of like Kelly Blue Book, no one gives a fuck. Yeah. You know? So uh, when I end up selling, I just want to see how it feels. I'm like, what I feel like I missed a chunk of me. And when I sold it, I was like, oh shit, like I didn't really care. My happiness didn't drop. And then so I think at that point, then I started to go like, well, where, um, cause like, I think when you spend money, you want happiness in return. Yeah. I'm like, where does my happiness lie? And then, so when we built a pool in our backyard and you see like family come over and like the kids, like your, your brain starts to get rewired, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, that's happiness. Yeah. But without the car, how do people know you're successful? <sighs> I know you got to, you got to floss. Okay. Dude. So you bought a fancy car. <laughs> have you ever bought a fancy item for yourself? Like a watch? I have a, I have a couple watches that I like. Is that a Roly? Yeah. It's a Roly, Roly Casio. <sighs> <laughs> Roly Casio. <laughs> I think like, so I, I don't, so these things, they're just stuff that I like. I would say like, what's the most expensive watch you bought? Oh, they're not even that expensive. I mean, for the Houston group, they're not very expensive. <laughs> I, I bet. The, the only exp expensive watch I owned was a gift. I didn't even buy it. How much was that worth? How much is it worth? The, the, this is an Omega Speedmaster. Oh, it's sick. With uh, Christian got me this. This is like a uh, like a thirty five hundred dollar watch. Mm -hmm. This is a ten dollar if that uh, silicone band from Amazon though. Oh, it's comfy. <laughs> yeah, put it on there. But I, I would never buy an expensive watch. Like I, I really wouldn't. Why? They go up in value, you know that? I because because I I think things are only investments if you plan on selling them. Everyone who's like. I bought these watches, but I'm like, are you buying them to sell them? If not, then why do you, why do you care about the value that they're going to go up? Like if you're, if you're never going to sell it in case, I don't know, I guess this is a physical NFT. Okay. How, so how I, much is that watch? So when I got this back in, when JK first, I think broke like the six figure mark in terms of not uh, as a company, but when me and my partner could pay ourselves a six figure salary, we're like, okay, cool. We like made it, you know, that's our first step. Let's go spend money. Yeah, let's go spend <laughs> some money. <laughs> and uh, I bought it for eight grand. And uh, this watch this today is worth 17. Pretty cool. But are you, are you going to sell it? Never. Because it's my first. Then who like, cares how much it, it's worth? Because I can pass it down to my kids one day. I don't know. And like, here you go. Uh, and if you ever sell it, I'm going to smack you. And I could post it on Instagram and people think I'm successful, you know? Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> you're like, uh, you're like, just getting a, my drink. Yeah, yeah. Snap it right there. Yeah. You know, I heard on the Graham podcast. Besides that, you're a bodybuilder. When you talk <laughs> when you talk about all the all, <laughs> when you talk about all the money you're bringing in. You said on there that you got a seven figure brand deal one time. Oh, uh, we had a from seven, JK. We had a seven figure deal. It wasn't a brand deal, but it was a it was a deal. That's uh, over a million dollars. Yeah, for people who don't know, it's pretty fucking and, cool. And you didn't say in the body. You said the company doesn't exist. Can you say that the company was? It doesn't exist anymore, Bart. I don't know if I can, but I'll say it starts with a V. Viagra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no it, wasn't a, it wasn't a brand deal. So this was during the time where uh, Viacon, where social media was popping off like crazy, and YouTube. This is like yeah, I think before TikTok. You know, probably even before life uh, was better before TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like before Vine. It's like YouTube's this dominant force. Yeah. I don't even know if Facebook had uploaded content or anything. So people were struggling to come up with platforms, and then there's this company that it seemed on paper it was going to be this super group because you had like the head of programming from Hulu. You had like chief of operations from Amazon. Like it just looked like on paper, this is going to go really, really far. And what they were banking on is they called it, um, I think like first window release where they're saying how like, uh, you know, like when, when you have movies, the first big chunk of money is made at the box office. Yeah. And then the second is once it hits like DVD or whatever, right? So they wanted to apply that to the online content model. So they paid us seven figures. Oh, so this went through. It went through, yeah. So it paid us seven okay, figures. What is seven? Like, what was it? One million and one dollars? Was it, it was, seven I million dollars? it was literally just a million dollars. Not bad. Pretty cool, right? So it was like a million dollars to upload your content onto this platform first for only three days ahead. 
So it's like such a no brainer. It's, so it's like when uh, they, uh, when they start, when they, I'm going to beat YouTube, I'm going to start this new platform yes. and they bring Ninja in to be the guy. Exactly like that. And so they brought us in and ours was like one of the lower of the deals. This is like back. Uh, so the, the YouTube, um, the MCN or like the, the network that we we're with was called uh, the collective back then. And in the collective, even though we had like a million subscribers, we're probably like low on the totem pole. Cause this is like, like Freddie W epic meal time. Like you got mm -hmm. like giants, right? So I think those guys probably got paid like eight figures or something like that. What the? Fuck? Just to post their content. That they're already making. Already making three days earlier. It was like the non-sexual only fans, like eight hey, post the same content. Yeah. We'll give you more money. Yeah. So when we saw that, we're like, of course, you know, <laughs> but we just, and it was just, we just had to do it for like a year. And so we did, so we made uh so I, it wasn't like a one time here's like, briefcase full of like seven, how, seven figures, you know? seven millions. Yeah. How, <laughs> yeah. how many people are in your JK that you have to, you have to split that $1 million with. So with us, um, what we did was in our crew, we were like, you know what? Like all the people that rode with us for a long time, we cut them like super big, big, big check. Yeah. I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and with, with like, cause like people that are like, so everyone that we have like on salary, like people that made like, let's say four or five or six grand a month. Um, the JK model at the time too is we, since it's a family business, we uh, took December's off so people could be with their family. And on top of December, every single year, we paid everyone a two month salary. So they technically, people make 13 months worth of salary in one year, but you only have to work 11. Mm. So that was our model. So like December, cause a lot of people from out of town were like, you can go back to Texas, go back to wherever. Um, and you guys could be with their family. No one works uh, in December and we'll give you double that month. Is that still a thing? Uh, it's still a thing. Yeah. And we'll, and we'll do that. And so, so yeah, people were making regular salaries, like four or five, six grand a month. And then when we got those, uh, when we got that, the, the million dollars, we started cutting checks to like, and we have like a roster of like 10, yeah. 20 people, people would get like 20 grand or like 30 grand or whatever. And then they're like, what the fuck? It was, it was crazy. So you just took, took this money of like, Hey, we're already making this content guys. And you got this giant paycheck and you're like distribute to the people. Yeah. And That's then, awesome. and then we're like, let's invest back in ourselves. I don't know if you've ever visited our, like our studio that we built. I don't think so. I've been to one of your offices. So yeah, we built our own like sound stage. So, uh, I think like maybe like 400 grand of that. That's what you're talking about. That was like custom for yours. You yeah. We built our own sound stage. ended up being the stupidest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Cause now looking back, I'm like, we could have took the 400 grand that went into the soundstage and go, Hey Joe, you get 200. I get 200. Let's go buy some homes or some shit. Yeah. But we, uh, we put it into soundstage and it didn't end up turning well, but it was cool to like have walked through the process and like, just learn from what I call like tuition, you know? Cause like anything that fails, I see it more as tuition. Cause you're just, you're getting a learning experience and it's not so much of a failure. That's an expensive ass learning experience. Oh yeah, dude. The amount of money that people probably Every six, every person that you see that's been doing something for a long time, making you know very good money, whatever that that is, has spent so much money. And people always ask, like, you know, if you could go back and change anything, and everyone's always like, you know, I wouldn't change. Everything was like a learning experience. But I think everyone's probably like, well, we shouldn't lose out on hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of profit because yeah. of this dumb shit that I thought was smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that really is like the whole like learning process. Yeah, it's like a like four hundred thousand dollar tuition, you know. And now with you saying that. You know, you talked about like Epic Mealtime, for example, um, who's getting these like potentially these big brand deals. Obviously, social media has not social media. Um, people's popularity kind of like peaks as much as people want to admit it mm -hmm. that there is like the time. You know, you always think it's like it's never going to go down from this. And it's yeah, just growing, yeah. growing, growing. And like it, there's been the peak of everyone. Um, how do you think uh, social media has evolved from when you maybe everything you were doing was at like the peak of the peak compared to now, like how, like what your mental space is with like accepting. Are you asking me like, how does it feel to be a has been? Yes. <laughs> well, cause I, I, I talk about it a, a, a lot, right. Yeah. Um, on my own channel and some people like, it, I, I'm definitely bummed that, you know, I just think I'm like, no, I'm super cool. Everyone should keep wanting to like fuck with me for forever. Yeah. And like, I'm, I'm the coolest of the cool, but I realize people grow up and grow out of touch and where people were, when they started following you, they're not on that part of their life anymore. And they, you know, they, they started their own the kind of journey. But how, how do you deal with, uh, as weird as it sounds, like the decline, the decline of yeah, like yeah, the yeah. popularity of, of because it it's literally to everyone. Yeah, I think for me, I have a pretty realistic approach where like 
the bands or the artists that I listened to in high school, I don't really listen to now. Yeah. Right. So I think that's just normal. It's like what happened to Incubus or whatever, you know, it's like, it's like, like that. So for me, um, I, I understand that. And I know at a certain period of people's lives, they really relate to us and then people are going to grow and they're going to expand their minds. And some people will stay and some people will have different tastes. You know, like there's a point in time where I thought someone getting kicked in the nuts was really, really funny. It is very funny. It's still funny. Yeah, that, no, that's a bad example. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there's like some things you laughed at before and then now yeah. you don't laugh at anymore or whatever. And so I think for me, I think that's a uh, necessary part of it. But I also know, and I have, I have friends in this space, like Bobby Lee, for example, he was like mad TV star. And then for like a 10, maybe 15 year or maybe even 20 years, just like this low. Mm-hmm. Right. Didn't even know what to do. What's doing stand up comedy or whatever. And then boom, hit this new thing like podcasts. Yeah, he does. Uh, what's it called? I, Tiger Belly. Tiger Belly. Yeah. He, he's been on a bunch of like the, I know. Well, they went through some drama for a little bit with a bunch of people. Yeah. But uh, I know he was on like Ethan H3H3 mm-hmm. recently. And I, I watched uh, some clips of, of the Tiger Belly. Yeah. Tiger Belly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, when you were on there. So what is so there saying? He kind of. Yeah. So back. now it's like he's back and he's like dominating more than ever. And so I think, and even like Mike Tyson, you know, I just uh, know that like, it's really important to find what you love and don't let the success of your passion be dictated by views and um, like dollars and stuff. Cause that stuff is, you can't control it. You can't control the algorithm. And it is up to you to like uh, package your own voice into a way that um, is best suited for the platform. But that's like a whole nother like science and business to it. But I think if you Love what you do. You'll have your second, third, fourth wind, uh, wind or whatever, you know? Yeah. So for me, I have a very like realistic approach where like right now, um, timing wise, even it works really well for me because I'm really in the dad mode, family phase. So um, when, when JK was like at its peak, I'm flying out to places like literally every other weekend, sometimes two places in one week. And that would be crazy. I would probably be, never be there for my kid growing up. Mm-hmm. So now that I'm like a has-been, it's pretty cool that I can like be with my kid and family like way more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you're still putting out so much content. Like it actually kind of blows my mind because you have your, the JK and even on just barbell, for example, I mean, I mean you, do, you do the JK news, you have all of your barbell content, which you're still a big part of, whether it be, you know, here's a, you know, like a, a recipe with Bart mm-hmm. or, you know, a workout and you have your talk show on there, mm-hmm. which I kept thinking was like clips from a podcast, but I guess you just filmed them for these segments. Yeah, we just film, we purposely film like a specific topic, like would you take steroids? And then that's it. It's that's like, the bam. whole thing. Yeah. A- a- and you have the, the Barton Geo kind of uh, vlogs. Mm-hmm. You have that. And y'all started your own podcast, the Get Close mm-hmm. podcast. Mm-hmm. How does someone output? And then, I mean, as, a, as I know you're an older guy, you're still also doing so uh, has been and I'm older. Correct. Thank you. You're doing big stuff, you know, whether it were real estate investments, trying to make your money stretch. So outside of being just content creation bar, you have that, that whole side. How do you balance do put outputting so much content on like a weekly basis? So there's like a, um, a method that I do and it's pretty bro of me, but I almost treat like my life, like a program. So you know how like let's say like your bench sucks or whatever. You're like, you know what? How do you know that? <laughs> it does. I'm how like, do- I'm like, I probably need to bump up the frequency. You know, maybe benching once a week isn't good enough. Maybe I'll do two, three times a week. Um, like let's say maybe your deadlift's really good. You're like, maybe I only need to do that once a week. You know, and then so like I pretty much uh almost program or schedule my week based off like frequency, volume, intensity, like just the way a program would be, and um that's how I balance like everything that I do. So for example, like our podcast that me and Geo do, we shoot all of them like one time a month. So it's like, what, I, what do you mean all of them? Oh, we'll shoot like all of them for the month. So like we'll shoot like four to six episodes in like a matter of one or two days. Wait, so you film an episode and then you like, all right guys, oh, we'll see you in the next one. And we're all literally right. shooting right the next and then five you, minutes right after. How, how do you in the, in the headspace do, like act like it's a whole nother thing? Be like, all right, what are we going to talk about now? I think we've done it for so long. Like this is going to be my 15th year on YouTube that it's like our work capacity is like crazy high, you know? Damn. Yeah. Like I think like how Nick bear approaches marathons, mm-hmm. I could probably approach content that way. Like we could, our, our work capacity is like, cause at our peak where on JK news, we would film 40 videos in one day. See, I, I, I guess I, I can't come, come, 
I can't like figure that out in my head because I've never been like that. It's yeah, like yeah. I film a video and then like the next day I I I think of an idea and let's start a new video. It's yeah. not like end a video, start a video, end a video, start a video, yeah. just immediate after. Yeah. Well, we we'll do like like bulk. So we because of our so it, it kind of all evolved like from our JK films days where we did uh, skits and stuff. Right. Like in order to stockpile, we have a very almost like Hollywood type system. So we have like pre production, but in our pre production phase, we'll write like. 20 or 50 scripts, right? So even with our podcast in our pre-production, we'll, we'll write out all the topics. Then we go to production. So we shoot everything we just wrote. And then when we're in post-production, then all of it gets edited. So we kind of took that approach um, over time and we applied that to like all the other, yeah. um, every other channel that we have. You're so, you're, I like how you like your know, pre-production, you know, the production of it, the post, but you're very uh, scientific, technical with your, technical, your terms. Yeah, yeah. I remember... Uh, Bart came for like a couple months ago before this podcast studio. <laughs> yeah. And it was just to like, Hey Max, I want to do like a tour of Alpha Land. And this man, like the night before sends me like the, the, the sh call the, sheet, the call sheet. Yeah. And it's like Bart and, you know, videographer to arrive eight, 8 AM meet Max eight fifteen, And it's like a line items of everything mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. going to happen. And I'm like, damn, this must be like a big deal. And it's just, it's just a video. It's just like, <laughs> Him and his videographer just get out of the car. <laughs> yeah. Like I thought it was gonna be like this whole team, and I was like, "Why did you send me this whole shit?" Yeah, you thought it was gonna be like a sound guy, <laughs> yeah, and like all this crazy. I was shit. like, "Is there makeup or something?" Yeah, like, yeah, no, we that all just came from the JK side of things because when we're shooting um, like those skits, we would have like like stunt people or people from Hollywood and whatever. And when we're shooting those skits, it is like a crew of ten people, so we're just so used to it. Like even having. Um, like we had a grandma that like broke her wrist on set. So like even having the nearest hospital on the call sheet, like all yeah, that stuff, it makes sense, you know? Yeah. Or like knowing when the sun's going to set in case the shoot goes long, you know, when you're going to lose light. So all those things that um, on a normal YouTube video, it doesn't really matter. But when we were shooting stuff like that, it actually matters. And we just kind of carry that over. So it seems like overkill and professionalism, but it's just what we're used to. Yeah. It turns out you send this whole call sheet and it's just, Bart just wanted to kind of carry the camera around and film me like walking around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was wild. Yeah. And so w with your kind of, you know, again, you're old as fuck Thank and you. uh, your life has changed a lot I over 15 oranges. years. Loves oranges. <laughs> Super high vitamin C intake per day. Yeah. What is uh what is your daily life look like right now? Now? Yeah. So now um, when I'm at home, I'll wake up at like six because my kid is a early riser. So we wake up at 6 a.m. every day? He wakes up like 5.30 or 6 sometimes. Sometimes at 3 a.m. And I'm like, go back to bed. <laughs> Dad, I want to play. No. Because he wakes up and he's like 100 miles an hour. Like he comes into the room and he goes, wakey, wakey. <laughs> I'm like, no, go back to bed. It's still dark. So I wake up. My normal day is I wake up at 6. And then I get him ready for school. And then we take him to school uh, by the time. And I'll get home probably by like 7.30 or 8. I train. And then from 10 to like 2, 3-ish. I try to work as intensely as possible so that like I um, can have the rest of the day be. What do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, obviously like, like intense, like what is intense working? Is it like, I don't look at social media yeah, like that. So I think, uh, cause you can get carried away on social media, you know, yeah. or even like, um, I'll even set like markers for myself. Like not only do I write down the list of what I'm supposed to do before I get into it, I attach times to when they should be getting done. So like, let's say I need to do this task. It's easy when like your creative brain turns on and like a task that should take 20 minutes takes like three hours because you just, you go down the rabbit hole of research, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at things. I'm like, okay, what is going to satisfy this initiative by at least 90 or by the most 90% and I'll write times. And then, so now I have to stick to those timelines. And then, so that I can manage it almost like managing my own lead time. You know, like what's my lead time to write copy for an email. I could sit there and try to like, spend three hours or could I bang it out in 20 minutes and does the same. Do you schedule your days out every day? Uh, yeah, I schedule. So on Mondays, I schedule out my whole week. What? And then is on, that part of your Monday schedule? It, it, do you have, do you have a block that's blocking out my, it's my very week? meta. And yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So like Mondays, I schedule the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> the entire Monday is scheduling my Tuesday through Friday. Yeah. 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 And then I, I, then at the morning of each day, I schedule the, the actual like per hour or per half hour schedule. What happens if something like it's all right, time to start the next task. You're not done with the first one. Do you, do you like a, make note of that? And in the future be like, why did this take me that long? Are yeah. you super analytical about it? You're like, 
whatever it is, what it is, it's done, or I need to extend this out. I uh, most, if it's not urgent, I'll go, okay, I'll, I'll revisit, I'll revisit that on. So I'll give myself like almost like overflow space on like Thursdays and Fridays. And then, so whatever I don't finish, then I'll just put it there. But if it's urgent, I'll, I'll just have to push the other things back. Do you like, I, I've never been someone who's scheduled. I've never scheduled my day. I'll have like, oh, I have a meeting at 12. That's happening. That's scheduled. Mm. But I don't block. I, I, I just come in the office I'm like, okay, what do I need to do? Okay, let me start <laughs> on this. And then I get distracted. And it's just like, it's like this uh, structured chaos in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, it, it's probably not efficient, but I mean, I've never gone to the, Schedule thing? Do you like that? I need to do it or else I'll freak out. Yeah? Yeah. It's like, it's literally like my program. I'm like, oh shit, why are my calves so small? Oh, because I didn't hit them at all this week, you know? And then I'm like freaking out like three months later. I'm like, damn, my fucking calves are really tiny still. So I just need to like go like, because there'll be times where like, you know, things fall through the cracks and I'm like, oh, what happened to that thing that I was supposed to do with JK or what happened to that thing? And I'm like, fuck, it's because I never even thought about it. So for me, mm. I have to, uh, I always have to write it down. Yeah, I always, and even on the schedule that I write, even though it's, it's not even organized, it's on a blank sheet of paper. So it's phys you physically write. You're not, you're not, you're not on your, your phone. Or, no, no, I physically write it. And even on the side, at the beginning of every single uh, week, I write down all the entities that I'm involved in just to kind of remind myself because do, there's so many things. Do you get to put like, when you successfully for like, oh, this is going to take an hour. And at the end you put like, you're like, I did it. And you put a little star. You're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, I finished. Give my, I, pat I need back. a little apple juice box to celebrate. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll scratch it out and actually feels good. I'm like, cool. Did this. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, wait, oh, I messed it up. Oh, on the race. Yeah. So uh, it, you said like 10 to two, 10 to three. Is that structure? Like, like, so on a typical day, we'll say a Wednesday when there's not like meetings, like yeah. what, what do you do from 10 to three? So 10 to three, um, it could be like, what is work for you? Work, like, dude, it could be anything. So at Barbell, I, the, I guess the hats that I wear is I'm the creative director. So anything that we make, I have pretty much the initial and then final say on it. So whether it's supplements, apparel, um, or, uh, videos, like that's me. Um, so I have to do that. And then, uh, for the JK side of things, that's a little bit easier. It's a well-oiled system. I'm mainly cast, so I show up to perform, and then I'm the producer. So scheduling all the shoots for the rest of the year, who the guests are, um, that's me. And then on the business side of things, which we only have to meet on like once a month, um, that's, that's like way easy just to see like, okay, cool, our views going up. Are they trending down? How's Instagram doing? Are we spending too much money on lunch? You know, like just like- Too much money on lunch. Because you know, like when like- <laughs> When you're in like a fully creative space, sometimes like we'll go like, um, dude, we should we, we have this on the call sheet, right? Like we're going to eat this. And then in the, in the heat of the moment, because we talked about this article, dude, we should also add McDonald's and then we should also do this. And then we have like this crazy ass lunch. And at the end of the month, when we look at our finances, like, dude, how come we spent like three thousand dollars more than we did last week on food or last month on food? And then mm -hmm. we go and we're like, oh, fuck, we order three lunches at once and we didn't even need to because we're just going crazy, you know? Because it's like a fun, like comedy improv environment. And that goes from the content to everything else. To okay. ordering food, to someone randomly wanting to throw a ball through the drywall or whatever. It just goes crazy. These so, are for like skits and stuff? No, it's just, we're just crazy people. We're just nuts. When you write, like a, when you said, <laughs> when you said you write down a skit or whatever. Yeah. I, so I, I like to consider myself someone who's mildly funny, but I'm not really funny in terms, like I, I can't, I've never like, I'm going to, I'm going to write a funny thing that people are going to like act out. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah, yeah. I, how do you, how do you be like, okay. Um, all right. Like, how, like how do you, what's the process of so, writing a funny. So comedy, sketch? comedy is an art form, right? It's like playing piano. It's like writing notes to the song. So there's people that are funny and there's people that can't be funny, but when you want to write like jokes or punchlines or stand up or even like sketches, um, that's its own art form and it has its like own formula. And then over time you kind of put your own personal. So there's funny in. writers and there's people that can deliver that in the funny method. Yes. So it, it's for, like, is Will Ferrell actually funny or is the people who wrote Will Ferrell's lines funny? Will Ferrell is funny. Yeah. I, hmm. From someone that in a comedy background, I can tell like you could probably give him like a B or C level script because of who he is. He could probably turn that script and like make it A. Oh, cause he's just a funny guy. Okay. So what's the, what's the mindset of writing funny things? Cause you said you write. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, for before, like, or what I'm writing now or like, what do yeah. You like, like how do you write a sketch? Okay. So, uh, if I were to teach someone how to write a sketch in like five minutes, it starts with this thing called universal truth. 
So all comedy is based off truth. Okay, there's a science to this. All right, hold on. Okay. All right start over. Start okay. over. Okay. So you have to write the universal truth. So universal truth usually is something that everyone knows it's called a trope. Because if you it's, if it's too niche, you're gonna lose your audience, right? So that's why a lot of them are like, you guys know how you guys know how like people that drive beamers like suck. It's it like has relatability. To, okay. Relatability. So you have to start with the universal truth, but the universal truth has to be packed with a little bit of insight or irony. So it's something that everyone knows, but because of your observation. It takes it up one step okay. a little bit so that people usually, if they're not laughing at the first line, which is the setup or the truth, it's no good. Because they're like, oh, that's true. Like, I never thought about yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. So okay. they laugh first. And so when uh, you have to do that, and that would be considered like the setup. And that, if you're writing a skit, that's what the whole skit is about. So do, are, do you have any favorite like Dave Chappelle or like Key and Peele skits at all? <laughs> all my Dave Chappelle favorite ones are the ones that like are the most like ridiculous like, like just radical stuff that he's done. Okay. Uh, let's, do you remember uh, the, one of the first Key and Peele skits that like, um, went crazy viral and then it's them meeting. And then they're like, uh, he was saying like how his wife told him something. And then he goes, and then I said, bitch. Do you remember okay. that one? Yeah. Yeah. So that key, one. Key, did Key and Peele do the one where like Obama meets each person and like, when he yeah, goes he like the white, white people, no, the white, white, white people like shakes like this. Yeah. And, <laughs> no, you've seen that one? I'm Is that sure. Key and Peele? I don't think it was. Anyway, ignore what I said. Yeah. Anyway, like, let's say, like, uh, let me see if there's a, okay. Yeah. So like, let's say the one that the key and peel one where they go, like I said, bitch. So the theme of that would be, um, or the universal truth of that would be guys are way braver when their wives are gone. Right. right. So for that, when you write a script like that, you are like, okay, Hey, that's a, that's a universal truth. I noticed that people, they act way tougher. So now that you have universal truth, now you have these things called heightening devices. So hiding devices is how do I make this come to life and have each one go higher and higher and higher? How is there so much depth to comedy, dude? There I, is, there is. I, I'm just like, think of funny shit to say. And there's like over 40, because it's an art form. Yeah. There's over 40 heightening devices. So you can fast forward in time. There's this one, it, there's one called like, if this, then what? And then there's like, there, yeah, there's just so many. Um, and then so for them, they decided to choose more and more obscure locations. So in the beginning, it was like, they meet at the door, the wives leave, like, and then I told her, I said, bitch. And then, so the next one, they go into like the attic or whatever, cause then they're like extra scared. And then yeah. the final beat in that script, they're in space. And then they're still saying like how brave they were. So that's their heightening device. So yeah, that's how you would write like a, a, a oh shit. That's how you would write like a, a funny sketch. So you have to start with universal truth. Then, um, and then there's a bunch of like other stuff called like, uh, like, you know, you hear in stand up where it's a callback. Yeah. Where they like something like, in the act three of their stand-up, they, they call reference, that. Yeah, they reference yeah, yeah. something. That, There's also something called like a turn where logically it's going this direction and all of a sudden it ends this way. So yeah, there's like, there's all these like techniques, if you will, in comedy. Huh. Yeah. And why do you think people that write comedy aren't the people, do you like, do you, like, I guess it's kind of like they're songwriters for like maybe Drake's song that yeah. you like love. They're like, oh, Drake didn't write that. And everyone's like, if you don't write it, it's like some people, their expertise is not the deliverance of yeah, the, it's a the way concept. different art form. So I would say, in terms of like comedy, I think I'm a much better writer than I am a performer. Really? Yeah. So like, if I were to do a stand up comedy, I would be one of those guys that have it probably like eighty percent written, and then I would take it to the local clubs and get it polished before I perform. And then when I perform, it's probably going to be verbatim, even like me scratching my head or even me pretending and like holding on the punchline where it looks like it's so organic, or whatever, it's going to be completely rushed. When, when you say it's like, like polished, is that kind of like when, when someone's going back and forth, like thinking up some random skit and you're like, Oh yeah, actually, you know, be funny as if like after that you did this, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. like polishing it up. Yeah. Or even a choosing a word that's a funnier word or adding a, um, before you like hit them with the punchline. Like you, it's like even the cadence of how the, the, the punchline comes out, all of that, um, adds up to how funny something is. Huh. Yeah. So really, like, that's it's interesting. I wonder, I wonder, it'd, it'd, be, it'd be cool to like meet funny writers. Like, you know, you're a funny writer. You're yeah. not actually a funny guy. You're just a funny writer. Maybe, I don't know. Have, have, <laughs> do, you, do you think if you have something like a really uh, great comedy sketch, like how do you- In a writer's room, like let's say for an SNL or whatever, you got like eight, 10 people and they're all writers, right? They're just sitting back thinking of funny. There's like- <clears throat> Yeah, they'll be like, you know, it'd be funny, and then sometimes they'll literally deliver. Hey, you know, it'd be funny if uh, whatever, like, uh, if they did this. Another person, oh yeah, that is funny. That would be hysterical. That's I hysterical. really think the audience would go crazy for that. Yeah, and it's like that dry. 
But because they know the formula so well, they're like, that'd be so funny. Oh, man. Oh, great meeting, guys. All right, cool. Get that. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? So, and, and how long does it take to write, like, a sketch? Dude, it could, for us back in the day, some things just, like, bam, in an hour. Like, fucking a good three, five pages of, like, three to five pages of solid material. Sometimes you're stuck on the idea for, like, like, uh, like two weeks. Yeah? Yeah. And I, in, in your JK news, JK comedy, who's the funniest member? Who thinks up the funniest stuff? You can say you, dude. As, as, uh, like through what means? Who, who's just <laughs> like, everyone knows that he's the funny, the funny guy of the funny guys. Um, so in our extended group, I would say David So. Okay. He's just a funny person in general. Um, and he has bad luck. So like that's just like, shitty things rest. happen to him like on a constant basis. Like, he just falls down the stairs all the time. Like just and he's yeah and he's clumsy. So like he's just like a funny person. Um, in terms of like the most technical funny person, it's probably uh, me. I'm very very like a technical minded person. Like if I'm writing something, yeah. Um, my partner Joe, he's just so out there as a human being that his funniest moments, um, he is completely dead serious. But all of us are dying laughing. Yeah. And he doesn't even know what he did. That's sometimes like the, the actual, the funniest comedy. Yeah. Yeah, things yeah, yeah. where people like aren't even realizing how ridiculous it is. Like of what the person's like saying. Because they're serious. Yeah. Like he'll literally say it and all of us are dying. And he's like looking at everyone like, did I miss something? I was being serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, that is the dumbest thing you've ever seen. Like, yeah, yeah. No, that was a joke. I yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. So your schedule is kind of crazy. And I, and um, you, you said you worked till like three. Is that because you kind of, turn into I, I know you have dad bod but now you're also I have dad, dad bod some old and i have dad bod i wouldn't say you're summer shredded right now i i had way more fun on graham Stephen's show because he kept calling me a bodybuilder <laughs> yeah but i don't want to lie to you dude All you know right. yeah so you're in dad mode now dad mode. yeah yeah so i go pick him up from school and then we do the dad thing and take him to jujitsu and then um after he whoop my ass no, dude, he's like five soccer kick him. <laughs> he's a he's a black he's a black belt, but one kind of flick. He's about fifty pounds. He'd probably fly across the room. Yeah, so I take him to jiu-jitsu, and then afterwards we go play at home. So whether we go to the park or something like that, and we just kind of have family time, you know, either like watch TV or just just kind of hang out as a family. How old is your son? He's uh five this year. Okay, and and how has your life been since becoming a dad? Um, it's kind of cool. We're like. I, I felt like I was already good at making decisions, but now it's even faster because I think once you have a kid and you're like, you're living for someone else, um, like even things at work where you might've been stuck for a long time, you're like, none of this really matters because I want to see my kid at three. Yeah. So you're just like, boom. And you know, you could just make decisions so fast now. Because everything's for the betterment of, of the family, of the yeah. kid. Like how can we make our life better? You know, versus like sometimes you get stuck in artist mode. Like one of my uh, mentors, like he would like make fun of me because like he says like every graphic designer does this. He's like, does this look better or does this look better? Does this look better? You know, and you're literally option like one, option two. Yeah, and you're literally it's like, bro, to like the rest of the world, no one gives a fuck. Yeah, you know, and it's like you're just so stuck in something that's like, should I be like this, this, this hue of teal? That's like it's, like, like it's like Christian when he's like, dude, which hue, which, which like shade of green do you like out of these four? I'm like, bro, <laughs> these are the same color. Exactly. He's like, no, 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 no. this has one percent hint more of like. Hunter, I'm like, dude, no one's going to be able to tell a difference. Like, yeah. you're the only one that cares about this shade when they're that similar. Yeah, yeah. So when okay. you have a kid, a lot of that's like, doesn't fucking matter. You're like, this one, move on. Yeah. Okay. And what what do you think is, I, I think a lot of people are either, you know, hey, like, I can't wait to be a dad. I can't wait to to be a parent and kind of start that that next chapter of my life, which most people are maybe going to go down that path. Um, but there's also, I think, maybe the the hesitation or I guess being scared of like, I don't know how to be a parent. I don't know like how my life is going to change when I have a kid. Like I know it's going to change. Mm -hmm. um, I can't keep doing everything that I'm currently doing, whether it be on a fun side, on a work side, uh, you know, your schedule. Um, how, what, what advice would you give people of like scared of having a kid versus like, they know they want it, but they're like scared of how their life's going to change. Like how has life changed for you? Is it, are you like, is the best thing ever happened to me? I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me, but I also think I'm much more prepared to have a kid than like a lot of people. What do you mean? Like, I think um, like, you know, even probably our parents, or at least my parents were like this. I feel like the way they had kids back then, it was like, get in the driver's seat 
and then you're going to learn your license this way. Yeah. Right. Versus like going to like driver school and you practice and you get your hours in. You're like, okay, cool. Now I'm going to go buy a car. So for us, like we plan to have a kid. We knew which financial state we wanted to be in to have a kid. We know where we wanted to settle down. We know like how close we wanted the family members to be. So we had everything planned out. So then that way, the only real chaos that happens yeah. is when the kid comes out and like, it's very controlled chaos. Like I can, I, I know exactly what's going on versus I think a lot of people, they just have kids and then they're like, holy fuck, I did not know the kid was going to prevent me from my own personal wants. I can't go clubbing as much as I wanted before, or I didn't know it was going to be this much of a financial detriment. I didn't know I was going to lose sleep. And also I can't do this. And then like ruin 10 other areas of my life. When we had a kid, it was like, we already kind of lived like we had a kid mm -hmm. where we already started having like family time. We're going to cut work out. Like I'm not working already. Like before uh, the minute Gio was pregnant, I wasn't working until like nine or 10 at night anymore. You know, yeah. like we already kind of just had that. So it was, it was a very easy transition. So I was like, for, for most people, I think if you can get yourself like financially uh, time wise and have the mental space to kind of like, even like having a dog, right. To if you already puppy proof your house and your life, when you bring the dog in cool. But if you're just like on a whim, I'm going to a pet store, I buy a dog and like, holy fuck, this guy shit everywhere on my most yeah. favorite carpet. It's like, well, you probably should have removed the carpet before the dog came in, you know? Look at that. Everyone, Bart compares children to dogs. Yep, because they're the same thing. What's the biggest thing you've <laughs> learned? <laughs> I, you know, that's the one thing Honestly, I can learn about a kid. You, dogs you, prepare you for kids like crazy. Yeah, but you can't leave, a, apparently, you can't leave a child in a home for six hours by themselves. It's frowned upon. That's what the leash is for. That's what, <laughs> come on, we're, come on, come yeah, on. Yeah, come on here. What do you think the biggest thing that's changed in your life having a child? The biggest thing? What, 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 I take, I take that back. Only let me re, re, reword that. What's the biggest aspect about you and the way you are that has changed since having a kid? Oh. What has um, improved or gone down? What has, what has. Could be like patience, could be. What like, has proved to Bart Kwan? What did Bart Kwan prove to himself mm -hmm. after having a kid? Um, I think Bart Kwan proved to himself that what he wants doesn't really matter, which is like pretty crazy. Where like, I think before having a kid, I was like, for sure, I wanna make a movie. Um, like I have all these like creative passions that I felt like were like almost life goals, like almost like bucket list things. And before having a kid, like that was like my trajectory. And then after having a kid, it was almost like, oh, if that doesn't happen, it's cool. Like, I just want him to have the best life ever. Yeah, which is crazy. Like, I'm like, for me, I'm like, anything is up for grabs. Like, I can, like, um, if, like, YouTube exploded, I'm like, yeah, I'll just, like, work corporate America. That's no problem. Just as long as he has a good life. Yeah. Which I was, like, even a year before that would be impossible. I'm like, no, 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 dude, I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll sleep and live out of my car if I have to. I have to, like, have a stand-up special. I have to, mm -hmm. like, make a movie. You know, you know, there's all these goals that I was like, for sure. And then once you have a kid, I'm like, I don't know if any of that shit even matters. Yeah. Like, I just want to make sure he's not pooping his pants at a certain age and, you know, can play Frisbee out at the park, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. What's, uh, you know, what's next for you? What's on, what's on the horizons? What's on the horizons? Any, any, like, new stuff coming up? Or is it just, I'm going to keep trying to do the best with the businesses and keep them growing? I think just doing the best with the businesses, keeping them growing, um, really enjoying the next chapter of uh, Taika's life. So what I've also noticed from like other entrepreneurs that are like further down from me, it seems like you have a short window where your kid loves you. And then when they're like 12, <laughs> they hate your guts. Like one thing I've noticed from a lot of entrepreneurs, like they have a hustle mode that's like pre-kid, right? Yeah. Hustle like crazy because they, they have all the time. Then they have a kid and then most people, they're like their hustle mode goes down by half and it's like, oh, I really love my family. And then... Uh, your kid hates your guts. And yeah. then I see them back in hustle mode. So if you go to like any of these conferences or seminars, it's usually like, oh yeah, like hustle mode, my kid's one. Or yeah, I'm like, I got this new idea. And how old's your kid? Oh, he's 13. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. He hates your guts. So you're back on the market. You know, you know? I, I never went, I always say like, whenever I have a child, I'm like, I, I would hate to have a kid who was me when I was a kid. I never went through like, I hate my parents. I'm gonna run away. I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna get in like drug. I never Rebellious, went through that yeah. kind of phase. I was just like, running my mouth in school. That was like the biggest problem that I had. And I was just skateboarding and getting kicked out by police of like 
being in the, a loading dock in the back, like nothing yeah. crazy. Um, but I guess like your worst, I don't say your worst fears, but like going through this stage of like, did I do something wrong in the raising phase for, to make them go through this rebellious or like, I don't want to be too like the best parent ever. Cause then they feel like they need to rebel cause they're having this perfect life. Yeah. It's hard, hard balance. Yeah. That's the thing about being a parent. You could be completely wrong and then you could have the most amazing kid in the world. Like, I don't know, like, like I, I, people would consider Mike Tyson um, very successful, right? I think and so. He yeah. probably had, like, some of the worst parents on the, in, the, in the world. Yeah. And then you can be, like, the best parent in the world and then have, like, some crazy, like, drug addict kid. It's just hard. So I just think you just try your best and just know that your kid is going to have your DNA. So, like. That's some good DNA, dude. Is it? He's going to have a dad bod. <laughs> if I, <laughs> He's going to be a dad bod bodybuilder. Like, at our first parent-teacher conference, our teacher told uh, me that our kids like the cast the class clown and I'm like, oh makes sense you know like even like on my one of my recent posts on instagram um from like three years ago when this comes out like ta at taika's halloween parade at school he sees me he goes hey what's up bart Kwan? <laughs> like he just loves calling me by first name like first and last name and he just thinks it's so funny so just knowing that that's gonna be um a part of him a little bit of me and a little bit of geo so i just try to like go like what do you, what that I wish was my upbringing that could have made me better than who I am today. And I try to like cater that towards yeah. him. And if we have a second kid, it would be, I would try to cater another unique experience because every single kid is different rather than just doing like a blanket one. Honestly, you know? my best, I think advice for any parent of make sure the kid doesn't go down like a wrong path. Just when they're young, just go, Hey, don't ever do drugs. Don't do drugs. No you, meth. You think they'll listen? Maybe. I, didn't, I didn't listen at all. I did a lot of drugs. When you were younger in high school, See, I never did that. I, I wasn't even like the drinking in high school. I was, I was so afraid of getting in trouble that that deterred me from doing anything. Like I never was like, you know, smoking weed, like, you know, as a 16, 17 year old, like I just wasn't because I was too afraid of just getting, getting in trouble. I'm always, the, I always think of worst case scenarios. That's why, you know, I know it may not look like it, but I've never done any sort of like steroids because I've always, always really? worried. I know I was always worried that like, I would be the guy that would do it, get gyno, die, like get Bald. back, yeah. you know, act back, acne. Acne on your eyelids. Yeah, like, like I was like, <laughs> that will happen to me. And like, yeah, so yeah, yeah. when I was a kid, like when I'm 17, if like, if I smoke the dope, the cops are gonna be behind that bush over there and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to jail and I'm gonna ruin my entire life. And like, so I just. Uh, when I was 15, I think I was trying to transcend into the astral plane. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was trying to do. I was trying to do whatever I could where I'm like, Oh fuck! I'm in space. <laughs> <laughs> I was eating. They're like, "Hey man, this is like I don't care." <laughs> yeah, I'm gone. See you guys later for four hours. <laughs> well, that's cool, man. Well, it, it's uh, it's I've known you for a super long time. Yeah. I know we didn't dive into like our history, but you know we're in the the fitness space since like 2013, 2014, and it's uh, cool to see your you know how well you're doing now because there's a lot of people that you know we have uh not necessarily like fallen off, but have, have stopped. Like mm. have, I don't even say given up, but they yeah. just maybe Changed are doing less. Something. They're not doing it as much as uh, for whatever life reason. And yeah. there's very few of us, you know, like, you know, Christian, my, myself that are like, we all kind of like we're around the beginning and we're still to this day doing it. We may not be as popular as we were at some point, but yeah, yeah. Especially me. You guys are going to keep seeing these faces forever, forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and don't you forget it. But uh, cool, man. Well, I, I appreciate you having, you know, coming on the uh, on the show. Yeah, it was is, super fun. Is there anything you want to plug to the people? I'm going to put everything in the description. You got, you want to put your stores, your. So we uh, we just opened a store in Hawaii, Jumbi Waikiki, which is pretty cool. Um, you can go to jumbimatch.com if you want to buy like uh, little ones you can make at home uh, for yourself. And uh, Bartle Brigade, you know, that's where you can find your apparel supplements, um, that, our gym. And then Just Kidding News on YouTube is where you find the funny funnies. I'm going to put all the links down in the description, man. I'm, this was good. This was solid. Yeah. Hopefully you guys enjoy, you want to say something? I was going to say like, I know you're running out of guests. So if you want me to, <laughs> if you want me to come back and we could talk about how we know each other, we could do that too. Uh, I, I, you know, I, like I was telling Bart, uh, I had Taylor come on here, my beautiful girlfriend as a Halloween special because it made sense because we went on our first date exactly a year prior. So it just made sense to have it. And I got one comment that said Max is already running out of guests. Yeah, well, which you are. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, surprise guys, Christian and Joe are coming back in a couple of weeks. 
Is it because you wanted them back or so much or because I'm running out of guests? Who knows? You'll never know. Yeah. But ladies and gentlemen, that will wrap up, wrap up episode 27 of Don't Be Sour. Make sure if you're on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, boost the algorithm here. Tell your friends if you're on any sort of podcast streaming platform. Give us a five-star review. Makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And I can't wait to see you on the next episode. We drop new ones every Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you so much for tuning in. Eat more sour strips. And ever four, dude. Woof. That's a wrap. Come here. Hello. Man, you probably got to take a and fat if you wanna, shit. And if you want to do a uh, Barn Jill style, then go, episode 28, brand new day. <laughs> yeah. See how my clothes change? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 27. All right. Yeah, yeah. Watch episode 28. Go on. <laughs> All right, welcome to 28, dude. Yeah. Like, what have you been up to recently? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, last week was crazy, you yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> the last five minutes.